Now I'll take you live to another part of Capitol Hill for a hearing by the House Rules Committee. Today the panel's been discussing the procedures for floor debate on several bills, including the juvenile crime bill, which we expect they'll return to shortly. Right now they're working on the rules for debate on the aviation funding bill. California Representative David Dreyer chairs the committee. That at least in upstate New York is destroying economic development just based on the high rate of airfares in our state cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you, much, Mr. Thank Sweeney. You, Mr. We appreciate your being here. Our next witness is the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle. Uh, he does not uh, appear to be here. And uh, our next witness is uh, Mr. Obi. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to take long. I know you have. Thank you. A long We're looking forward to your testimony on the next bill. I'm not. <laughs> well, we are. <clears throat> Let me simply uh, make a few comments about uh, the bill that Mr. Uh, Schuster uh, has before you. I think that bill should not be for the Congress at all. And if it is, I certainly hope that uh, 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 this committee will. Uh, make certain that the amendment to be offered by Mr. Kasich, uh, uh, Spratt, Sable, Young, Obi, etc., 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 will be will be made in order. Last year, as you know, uh, this Congress um, uh, decided it was going to make highways a priority ahead of all others in budgeting. Uh, I take a back seat to no one in terms of my support for transportation, but I think that was uh, uh, a mistake. I think it uh, is not fair to remove one area of, uh, of the federal budget uh, from competition for funds by putting them ahead of every other uh, a portion of the budget. Uh, this year, this bill attempts to do the same thing with aviation. Again, I take a back seat to no one in terms of my concern about having modern aviation facilities. Uh, but the fact is that aviation is no more a higher priority. Uh, or, I mean, it's, it is in no way a higher priority for the American people or me than cancer research or education uh, or some of the other items that uh, meet the needs of our people. Uh, I understand Mr. Schuster has indicated that he would take care of uh, uh, the fact uh, uh, that he creates $13 billion more in spending room under the caps by, uh, by uh, asking for an amendment which would, uh, in, in the manager's amendment, which would uh, uh, ask OMB to reduce those caps by $13 billion. That's fine. That still doesn't take care of the remaining $26 billion problem. If you look at CBO's estimate of the problem, or the $21 billion problem, if you take a look at the administration's estimate of the problem. Uh, and uh, it cannot be denied that uh, this bill still eats up uh, somewhere between 21 and $26 billion more than would otherwise uh, uh, be in the surplus available uh, for a uh, 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 first fixing Social Security and Medicare and then and then available for whatever purposes uh, the Congress seems appropriate after those two problems are dealt with. But uh, uh, until we have those problems dealt with, I think it is uh, illegitimate of the Congress to place another large portion of the budget uh, uh, off budget. And this is certainly not a partisan issue, as indicated by the names who will be uh, sponsoring the amendment. I believe you have Mr. Spratt's statement uh, in the record uh, that I think you just entered. I would also make one other point. Much is made of the fact that there is such large uh, 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 balances in the um, in the trust funds that uh, that. Uh, uh, Chairman Schuster was talking about tonight. The only reason for that is that the authorizing committee has been able to muscle the appropriations committee through the years into providing general fund subsidies uh, to airport uh, transportation. Uh, the fact is uh, uh, that while, while uh, the authorizing committee uh, would like to suggest that the trust fund is supposed to be used only for capital expenditures, the general accounting office made quite clear 
when they reviewed the history of this trust fund, uh, which was passed in 1970, my second year here, it made quite clear that we did not intend uh, to require every dime that was, pr that was brought into that trust fund in any year to be spent in that year. Uh, uh, in fact, Congress specifically decided otherwise, and, uh, and if you check the legislative history, you will see that, uh, that it was uh, Senator Norris Cotton of New Hampshire, the manager of the bill, who clarified that when he said this, the use of the trust fund monies is subject to annual appropriations by the Congress and therefore is for the Appropriations Committee of the respective houses to review this program and through appropriations acts establish necessary priorities. That doesn't sound to me like the Congress intended that every dollar that went into that trust fund be spent in that same year. Uh, quite, uh, quite the contrary. Uh, to me, this is simply a blatant uh, effort to put one small portion of the budget ahead of every other portion of the budget. Uh, the purpose of the trust fund was to guarantee a source of revenue. It was not to guarantee a specific level of spending in any given year. And I think the General Accounting uh, Office review of the legislative history of the act makes that quite clear. So in the interest of uh, uh, balanced budgeting, in the interest of balanced priorities, in the interest of, uh, of, uh, of uh, keeping everybody on, an, uh, on uh, the same playing field around here, I would urge uh, uh, that uh, this committee uh, not bring a bill uh, that bill to the floor until there's agreement that uh, uh, that uh, uh, it's either going to be changed or at the very least uh, make certain that the Mr. Kasich uh, and others have uh, have the right to offer the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Obi. Mr. Goss, Mr. Obi, how many et ceteras are there? Do you think that would support your position on this? Uh, you mentioned a whole bunch of people who felt the same way you do. No, I, mean, I, I was referring to the people who were sponsors of the amendment. Exactly. I was going to how much support the amendment. No, I said I wasn't referring to support to the amendment. I was referring to sponsors of the amendment. Well, let me be very clear. I, then. I, I simply didn't remember who, who else had sponsored the I understand. The no, I'm, I'm not being system. facetious. I'm cl clear to know how much support I don't know how many there. will support our amendment. I think this institution, frankly, has a problem. I think we have allowed one committee, the Public Works Committee, to get so large that almost a fourth of the members of this institution have a, have a vested interest in supporting anything that comes out of that committee. And as a result, they have an advantage over every other committee in terms of getting their priorities first. Uh, that's not a partisan problem, that's an institutional problem. And, and uh, uh, I guess I would respond by saying, uh, I don't know what the answer is to your question. Uh, it depends on how many members are comfortable with putting the airport transportation funding before, uh, before saving the uh, surplus for Social Security fix-ups. Well, I happen to agree with your position, and I just wondered how much support there was uh, across the board out there. I don't have the foggiest. I would hope there would be a lot, because uh, virtually every member of this Congress has posed for political holy pictures on protecting Social Security. This is a time when they can do more than just pose. Mr. Linder, Mr. diaz Ballard, Mr. Hastings, Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Sessions, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. Obi. We appreciate your being here. Our next witness is the uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, we uh, welcome you, and uh, if you have a full text, it will appear in its entirety in the record, and we would welcome a summary from you. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm going to withdraw the text of my statement and thank this committee for its courtesy to me. Advise that I have spoken to Mr. Schuster. We'll be offering this amendment at some future time. I'm not going to bother this committee at this time about time on the House floor or having any amendment by me and put it under the, under the rule and express my thanks to you, Mr. Chairman, the members of the committee, for your courtesy to me and go my way, and I hope that you will be pleased with my well, we've had spectacular testimony throughout today and are looking forward to much testimony this evening. I doubt that anyone will uh, come to the level that you have just uh, set. So thank you very much for coming by to extend that uh, to us and for taking well, the time been, for you've that. You've been remarkably courteous, Mr. Chairman. I want to express my thanks. Does anyone have any questions of Mr. Dingle that you'd like to ask? I, I would observe, Mr. Chairman, I have some very fine testimony for you later on the subject of firearms. Oh, yes. Well, we uh, will look forward to seeing you later this evening on that one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. much. Our next witness is the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran. And uh, 
If you'd like to follow the uh, lead of the distinguished well, ranking well, member of the Committee on Commerce, given the reception you set an amazing got. precedent here. And, uh, Unfortunately, I can't follow okay. that, that, but it was, uh, that, yeah, it was impressive. I, but unfortunately, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to include this amendment because I think it's a constructive one and it's going to address one of the more contentious issues in the bill as it regards four large metropolitan airports. For more than 20 years, National, JFK, LaGuardia, and O'Hare have operated with a slot reservation system. It was developed for safety reasons to limit the total number of airplanes that were serving those congested airports. They were right in the middle of residential areas, and so it was, uh, uh, it, it was felt that uh, you needed to limit the number of flights. But now DOT tells us that the slot reservation system may no longer be necessary because new technology is in place in our aircraft traffic control system that will allow more flights without compromising safety. Now, some are uh, questioning the department's call to repeal the slot system, most notably the residential areas surrounding these uh, airports. Uh, but um, I don't think that adequate consideration has been given to those uh, communities that are going to be inundated with the increased noise. They use safety as the way to reduce the noise, but the noise is still a major problem, and that was the, basically the, the reason why uh, the restriction on flights uh, was imposed, I think, and DOT went along with it because of the safety consideration. So what we would offer is um, to condition new air service at those four airports on the Secretary's approval of a new airport noise reduction program that would include local public input and can include restrictions on the use of aircraft originally built for Stage 2 compliance. Uh, the, the problem here is that what is happening is that airlines are, retrofit, are using stage two airplanes to meet the stage three compliance by uh, reducing the amount of fuel in the airplane. So they go on short hauls, they go out of these airports, uh, and they go to cities that don't require a whole lot of fuel and they otherwise find ways to reduce the, uh, the weight of the plane. But they're still stage two aircraft and in fact, what is happening in most of these airports is that the noise is increasing. And so in fairness to those communities, any increase in service should be premised on providing the communities adjacent to the airports with an opportunity to revise the existing noise abatement programs. Uh, it, the amendment would also address uh, uh, this, uh, this loophole, as I say, because uh, a few are aware that FAA regulations, in fact, allow stage three compliance even by uh, using old planes and, uh, and retrofitting them and reducing the fuel load. Uh, the, uh, uh, but they, they're still much older and they're noisier uh, and they probably are a major reason why you have such adamant opposition from residential neighborhoods surrounding these four, uh, the, these four airports. Uh, the, uh, Tell me, excuse me, would you yeah. yield for a moment? What, what four airports? The JFK, LaGuardia, National Airport, and, and O'Hare. Okay. Now, if another amendment is successful that would simply limit any additional flight increase at these airports, and I understand Mr. Hyde is considering that, uh, that amendment, then this is no longer necessary. But if the amendment, that amendment were not to pass and the uh, committee felt that you do need to increase the number of flights, then this would be a compromise. This would simply say that um, uh, you can't use these older stage two airplanes in order to meet stage three compliance. That would uh, effectively address the noise problem and, uh, and probably bring, uh, bring the, the whole uh, airline industry up to date in terms of being able to increase the number of slots. So uh, representing an area that is heavily impacted by noise, uh, I'm going to try a, a compromise. If this compromise doesn't work, then of course we're just going to try to, to uh, prevent any, any increase at all in the slots. So that's the purpose of the amendment, okay. uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moran. We appreciate your hard uh, work on this, and I think it's uh, certainly worthy of our consideration. Mr. Goss? Uh, I think you represent your people well. <laughs> Mr. Slaughter? 
Uh, Jim, I understand yeah. that DOT has decreed that all airlines, all airplanes have to meet the stage three requirement by uh, January 1? Yes. And uh, are, 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 what, are you saying that that's not possible? No, what I'm saying is I think they'll all meet it by December 31st, 1999, exactly. Uh, that law that we passed 10 years ago right. requires you to have stage three. But what some of the airlines are doing is taking the old airplanes and uh, reducing the fuel load and otherwise modifying them slightly and using them for the short haul uh, trips, you know, so the, the small trips where they don't need much fuel and that way they're, they're exploiting a loophole in the law. And uh, the problem is that these old stage two aircraft are very noisy nevertheless and that's what people are complaining about. So I'm just trying to uh, ensure that the intent of the law is implemented and that, in fact, we can move forward without uh, a legislation which simply stops any further flights altogether. And, and you and, and your folks would be really happy if we got to stage three. Oh, yeah. The stage three is, is much better. It modernizes the fleet and they're much quieter as long as they're not retrofitted stage two airport, airline, air, that, airplanes. That's probably going to be a sticky wicket. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Well, Lair. I'm just curious if you cleared this with John McCain. I haven't uh, run this by Senator McCain. Uh, I don't think America West actually uses the old ones. They want the new okay. ones. And I, I think he would be shocked that I've come up with a compromise that would allow new slots, actually. So he'd probably like this. Good for you. <laughs> Thanks. Mr. Hastings, this is Myron. Thank you very much, Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer, and members of the committee. Our uh, final witness, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Weiner, and uh, again, you will uh, have many prepared remarks uh, included in the record. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. In my brief time here, I've noticed a correlation between the brevity of the presentation and the responsiveness of the panel, and I, uh, will, uh, <laughs> I, I will note that. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, this, uh, this Congress did a great service in 1990 by establishing the stage three, the goalpost that airlines needed to meet to reduce uh, the amount of noise going on at our, at our airports, at Brackett's Field, at Logan International, at Southwest Florida International Airport and others. By the end of this year, uh, stage three aircraft will be in place everywhere. This bill that we are going to be uh, passing or going to be considering um, will increase the amount of air traffic everywhere. And what my, my amendment would do, if it's permitted by this panel, would be to establish the next stage, stage four. It would call on the uh, transportation secretary to come up with standards for stage four and require that by the year 2012 those standards be put into place. Uh, what essentially it does is give us an opportunity, those of us who, who live around airports, and that's just about everyone on, on this panel, uh, give us an opportunity to vote to, uh, to have some standards out there that the airport, that the aircraft rather, have to target, have to meet uh, to reduce noise emissions. Um, I think that it is uh, it's something that would find wide support in the Congress. It's something that I think uh, we should do to give the, the airlines something that they should shoot for. Just as stage three, this Congress put the airlines on notice that they had to reach a target of reducing air noise emissions by 50 percent. They hit those targets. This Congress deserves a great deal of credit for holding their feet to the fire. My bill would establish the stage four, um, and I would urge, uh, I would urge this panel to allow it to be considered. Thank you very much, Mr. Weiner. Mr. Goss? Did, did this <coughs> bring any attention to the committee? In, in committee, what the, what the base bill does is says that uh, the, the uh, Secretary of Transportation has to look at this issue and has to explore new technologies, but it sets no, um, no goal for stage four. Uh, I, I should point out that, that the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization is on their way to establishing stage four, so uh, we're going to have to do it sooner or later. This might be an appropriate time to do it. Thank you. Ms. Slaughter? No, Thank you very much, Mr. Linder. Mr. diaz Bellard, Mr. Hastings, Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Sessions, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you very much. Thank we you, appreciate Chairman. your being appreciate here. It. And uh, that uh, concludes the hearing for consideration of H.R. Uh, 1000. And uh, we have uh, distributed the uh, rule. And with that, the chair will be in receipt of a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 1000, the Aviation Investment Reform Act for the 21st Century, Air 21. 
A structured rule providing one hour of general debate divided equally between the chairman and ranking minority member of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. The rule weighs all points for order against consideration of the bill. The rule also makes an order that Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure amendment in the nature of a substitute as an original bill for the purpose of amendment, modified by the amendment printed in Part A in the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying the resolution. The rule weighs all points of order against consideration of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. The rule makes an order only those amendments printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report accompanying the resolution. Amendments made in order may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. The rule weighs all points of order against amendments printed in the report. The rule allows for the chairman of the Committee of the Whole to postpone votes during consideration of the bill and to reduce voting time to five minutes on a postponed question if the vote follows a 15-minute vote. Finally, the rule provides for a motion to recommit with or without instruction. You've heard the motion of the gentleman from Sanibel, and I'd like to uh, give a brief explanation uh, by stating that there were 28 amendments submitted uh, to the committee. 14 of those 28 are addressed in the manager's amendment, which will be offered by Mr. Schuster and three of those amendments uh, were withdrawn. We saw Mr. Dingle come up. He was one of those who threw an amendment. And there were remaining 11 amendments, uh, and the proposed rule would make an order eight of those. One of the amendments, the Archer Amendment number 25, would be self-executed into the amendment in the nature of a substitute that will become base text for the bill. And this was simply a technical amendment uh, that is in the jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee to allow trust funds monies uh, to be spent. And with that, if uh, there's no other uh, discussion or amendment, uh, Mr. Slaughter, any? Then uh, the uh, question occurs on the amendment of the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Goss. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Between the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And uh, this uh, measure will be handled by the very distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Reynolds, for the majority and for the minority. The very distinguished gentlewoman from New York will be uh, handling it. And that concludes consideration of H.R. 1000. And uh, at this point, we uh, are going to return to uh, consideration of the hearing on, uh, on the uh, consequences for Juvenile Offenders Act of 1999 and the Mandatory Gun Background Check Act of 1999. And we have two members. I thought we'd completed uh, testimony from all of the uh, members of the Judiciary Committee, but Mr. Scarborough is here and wants to be heard. And well, we did. Well, we did announce that we'd completed all of the testimony of members of the Judiciary Committee. It's the first time you might regret having joined the Judiciary Committee. Uh, but we will uh, actually uh, hear from you and uh, would again welcome a brief summary, uh, if you uh, can, on the. Uh, on the measure, and if you have prepared remarks, they will appear in their entirety in the record. I'll be, I'll uh, be as brief as possible. You might want to turn the microphone on. Uh, it's actually, I, I wouldn't be doing this at all except for these neat microphones. I wanted to try them out, so anyway. It's good to be here. Good, good. Mr. Chairman, last week, uh, Mr. Delahunt and I introduced the 21st Amendment Enforcement Act. Uh, the text of this bill is... Thanks. Uh, last week, Mr. Delahunt and I introduced the 21st Amendment Enforcement Act, and uh, the text of this bill is identical to the Senate Bill uh, 577, which the Senate passed uh, last week. It was, uh, it was actually a bill that uh, Senator Hatch and Senator Byrd uh, put together and passed over there 80 to 17 as an amendment to their juvenile justice legislation. Our goal and the goal of that legislation was to stop the black market sales of uh, alcohol to minors. The amendment is necessary to enforce a decision made decades ago by the American people to prevent underage access to alcohol, to carefully control the sale and distribution of alcohol beverages, and to license and regulate those who sell these products. These laws are designed to prevent illegal sales to minors and respect the will of the people in states who regulate alcoholic sales in accordance with the 21st Amendment. And I'm sure all of you have seen uh, the media outlets that have reported uh, on the uh, ability of minors to purchase alcohol uh, over the internet and uh, to, to freely purchase alcohol. And unfortunately, because of the current state of the law, the state's ability to exercise controls 
are being undermined by wineries, retailers, and third-party marketers who are shipping alcoholic beverages directly to consumers in defiance of state laws using orders through telephones, catalogs, and the internet. This amendment simply ensures that states can stop illegal liquor sales to children, teenagers, and adults. Such shipments are neither uh, small or isolated. Forbes magazine reported that over a billion dollars in illegal sales of wine, liquor, and beer are shipped across state lines every year, and these sh uh, shipments cost states millions of dollars a year in lost revenue. These shipments include every type of alcoholic beverage from the least expensive half gallons of liquor to beer to costly wines. State attorneys general and dozens of investigative news teams have videotaped shipments of beer, alcohol, and wine being ordered and delivered to children as young as 13 years old. Clearly, some of today's internet savvy youth will take advantage of the state's inability to crack down on these shipments and order, order alcohol delivered to their door. These direct shipments bypass a key part of the state's control methods, the face-to-face -face transaction, in order to sell their products at the highest possible profit margin. Now, this new black market in alcohol is dangerous. If left unchecked, it will ultimately frustrate the ability of the states to regulate and control the shipment of alcoholic products, a responsibility that was mandated by the 21st Amendment to our Constitution. Our amendment offers a comprehensive solution that's carefully crafted to give states access to federal courts to enforce their laws without infringing on the use of cutting-edge marketing techniques if the deliveries and the sales that they generate are made legally. This amendment allows states to be as flexible as they choose on this issue. It doesn't mandate any state action or change any state law. This amendment does, however, give states the ability to ensure the collection of excise and sales taxes to require that sales occur through the licensing system and to be assured that IDs are checked before the alcoholic uh, products are sold. My interest in this issue lies very close to home. I've got two children that live in Florida and Florida's attempt to enforce its laws against illegal direct shipments was stopped by the state courts which ruled that it did not have jurisdiction. The issue was appealed to the state Supreme Court which upheld the lower court opinion and state attorney generals in Utah and Missouri have faced similar problems in enforcing their law. Now, some wineries complain about this legislation and say it's not fair, but in the end, this is the test. I mean, if what they are doing is legal, then this amendment will not apply to them. It's that simple. If they are selling alcohol legally, this amendment will not apply. It only allows states to go after wineries that illegally ship. Although illegal line, wine shipments have garnered the headlines, illegal shipments from retailers, third-party marketers, and others are a significant part of this problem. In fact, it was a recent court case against retailers shopping into Utah, Missouri, and Florida that gave rise to the need for this amendment, which passed in the Senate 80 to 17. The amendment offers a comprehensive solution that bolsters state laws that are already on the books. It proposes absolutely nothing new and many of those who are currently breaking the law are doing so even though they've been notified by the states that they're breaking the law. But the states simply have no recourse in this matter. They can continue selling wine, alcohol, and beer to children in states that, that can't uh, track them down uh, in their jurisdiction. Clearly, Congress has explored this issue and found it to be of great concern. We believe the time has come to act. We must eliminate the confusion over the ability of states to enforce their laws as protected by the 21st Amendment. The states must have access to the federal courts to enforce their alcoholic control laws over out-of-state defendants that use the Internet to, to sell to minors. And companies should not be allowed to hide their illegal conduct behind a legal technicality. States must have the authority to stop the illegal shipment of alcohol regardless of where the shipper is hiding. My amendment with Congressman Delahunt provides an effective, comprehensive solution without interfering with state law, the operation of the Internet, or legal mass marketing technology. Congress needs to act now and follow the leads of Senator Hatch and Senator Byrd, and I'd just like to ask unanimous consent to have a letter from the Attorney General from the State of Virginia entered into the record supporting without the amendment. Without objection, it will uh, be included in the record. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Scarborough. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Goss. Uh, Joe, thank you.
uh, by bypassing the, the local people. Uh, uh, how do the, uh, the organized distributors and uh, what, what people who sell legally in, in the states feel about this thing? Is, well, they, they, I'm sorry. Are they opposed to this? Yeah. No, the, the people that, that obviously sell uh, alcohol, wine, legally in Massachusetts or in Florida obviously are at a great disadvantage. Some estimates have, have had as much as 25% uh, of illegal sales. Uh, uh, flooding into markets and so not only are people that distribute in, in individual states harmed, the state itself is harmed also by the loss of the, loss the of taxes. taxes. Yeah. And there's no check to see the age of the person who orders the liquor? There's absolutely no ID check and what the wineries have suggested... Well it, it's the violation of law, it's selling it to a minor. Right, right, there, there is absolutely no, no uh, checking point, in fact that's what all these media uh, stings have shown that a 13 year old is is able to order alcohol over the internet have it delivered to their door and uh, and and there's absolutely no recourse a state a state cannot go after them and stop them have jurisdiction you need federal law to straighten this out is that it pardon me it has to be addressed on the federal level it, it certainly does it certainly does uh, it, you've got to give the state attorneys general the ability to go into federal courts and uh, sue people that are illegally shipping into their states. When, and, and of course, you know, for, for uh, conservative Republicans who certainly believe in states' rights, this is obviously not a violation of, of uh, a conservative's belief in the Tenth Amendment because the 21st Amendment clearly says these laws are going to be regulated That's by true. states. But states can't do that right now because of this and the internet technology is what what makes this uh, so necessary. Does your uh, amendment just uh, refer to alcoholic beverages? Does it refer to medicines? Because I understand certain medicines are getting in the hands of youngsters uh, without their parents' knowledge right. too. No, this is limited to alcohol sales. Okay. Well, I think it's uh, you know I can't say anything wrong with it. I, probably th I think it's a, it's a good amendment. Anyway, we can stop minors from. Uh, Obtaining liquor is a great way, and, and this is an avenue. It's, since it's a new way of doing business, that the, the government probably hasn't looked uh, that closely at it. Well, it really hasn't. I mean, there obviously are a lot of people that are are retailers now over the internet, but there's a big difference between J. Crew uh, selling a sweater over the internet and uh, a winery or an alcoholic distributor selling it over the internet. And that's why it's so important. That we focus on this now before it explodes. Yeah, thank you. I think it's thank a good you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Who's the, who's the cop? Who who checks the ID? Who, who's, who is the cop? Who who checks the ID on illegal sales over the on on legal sales over the internet? Well, actually, there are three distributors. Well, actually, there is none. So right how, now, there how is no How can you legally cop. sell over the internet then at all? Get your daddy's credit card. But if you're going to allow people to sell over the internet, provided they obey the laws, right? Some are going to have to check an ID. There actually there there are three right now. There are, are three distributors that are legally doing it over the internet, uh, who have a series of safeguards, and I don't ha I don't have those right now. But more importantly, they have made the conscious decision that they are going to abide by the laws of the states. Gallo is one. But yes. Yeah, was one, yeah. Right. So, so obviously for them, uh, they're they're losing money to these these uh, people that are are black marketers. What did the Senate? Didn't the Senate have an amendment that said the delivery truck driver has to check an ID? Well, actually, yeah, uh, Senator Feinstein did. I that is not in this amendment, and I think you're going to have an extremely difficult time uh, getting uh, UPS to agree are getting FedEx to agree to do that, that is not something that I suggest because, again, the last thing I want to do is stop people in my district or people in your district from being able to collect wine and uh, being able to order wine uh, that, that they may not be able to get closer to home. And I think the Feinstein Amendment is, is a bit restrictive simply because nobody will ship uh, wine if, if... So you merely want to allow the Attorney General to bring it to a federal court? To have jurisdiction. It, it, right. If there, if there is such an obvious uh, example of abuse of a certain distributor over the internet, 
the Attorney General will have the ability mm -hmm. to at least get jurisdiction. Let's get, get a good, good example. Let's say, for instance, that uh, my 11-year-old uh, purchases alcohol over the Internet and I notify the state attorney of Florida and it's blatant and he sold, uh, sold alcohol to my son for, for three months straight and knows that he's a minor. I can go to the Attorney General now and say, we've got this person out of Kansas, out of Topeka, selling uh, alcohol illegally. They can't do a thing. What this does is it just simply gives them jurisdiction. The Attorney General can go to federal court and can get, gain jurisdiction over a defendant in Topeka, Kansas and, uh, and uh, bring them to Florida. Thank you. For a no, I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, I want to ask a, just a follow-up. How does the dealer in Topeka, Kansas, know whether he's selling it to you or to your son? Well, and, and he doesn't. I mean, because there's absolutely no regulation, the dealer doesn't know that. That's, that's the concern I have on, on this kind of legislation, and it's the same problem with all the Internet. You start out with the legitimate customer, and somehow something goes wrong. Who do you hold accountable? Well, I, The enterprising I, child that stole his or borrowed his father's credit card? I can tell you my enterprising child would be held accountable. <laughs> yes, he well, stole my credit that. card. <laughs> but, he, but, he, he, he wouldn't be sitting down for a couple of months. No, I, I understand that, but that's, that's not really where the problem is coming. You follow state law, though. What does the state of Florida no, I, say about I agree about with what you're trying to right. do. I'm just trying to take it the next step. Right. But, How but do you, you make said, this work at the federal said, level? You said who's responsible, though. Who would be responsible? With, in the state of Florida, it might be different the way that they regulate alcoholic cells, according to the 21st Amendment, than, than how Kansas regulates alcoholic cells. I understand that. What I'm getting at is that some company may be doing business in good faith and think they are dealing with a bona fide lawful right. in that state right. customer. And they have no way of knowing that because it's an electronic transaction. Right, right. But, but if, there, if there is direct shipping, which this stops, if there is direct shipping, they know they are breaking state laws. All this is doing is this, this is encouraging them to actually abide by the laws of the state of Florida. In fact, the assistant uh, attorney general in Florida tried to bring a case. Uh, he tried to bring a case because there was illegal shipments coming in and they couldn't hold jurisdiction up. So again, this, this holds them to no new standard, no higher bar. Is, the, the bar is not raised any higher. All it says is if you are going to ship to Fort Myers, Florida, uh, then you better abide by the laws of Fort Myers, Florida. And, uh, and uh, you have to go through all the licensing requirements that a beer distributor in Sarasota or in Fort Myers has to abide by. Thank you. Yes. Um, it seems very reasonable to me. It makes sense. Um, my question, I guess, is who would oppose this if the companies are selling legally and allowed to sell legally and that's okay? Right. Who would oppose this amendment? That well, you know of. the uh, those who are uh, selling illegally Ones that over the are internet. intentionally out to break the law. Right. This. But the, no, but you don't have any mass opposition. No. Or anything. Uh, the the only opposition comes from from wineries and uh, and some other wholesalers. But the 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 fact is, the just the the unvarnished truth is, if they aren't breaking the law. There's no problem. They have absolutely nothing to worry about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer. Thank you. Our uh, next witness is the gentleman from New York, a member of the committee, Mr. Nadler. It appears that he's not here, so we will go on to uh, members who were not on the Judiciary Committee. And our uh, first witness will be the distinguished chairman of the Education and the Workforce Committee, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Goodling. Mr. Chairman, may I submit a couple of statements for the record? And without objection. Uh, I'd like to submit a supplemental statement to Mr. Jackson Lee and also a statement of Donald Payne. Thank you very much. Ellen Tosh. 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 Thank you. They'll appear, uh, they'll appear on the record. And uh, we are happy now to welcome the very distinguished chairman of the Education and Workforce Committee, and and uh, if you have any other members, Ms. Rockman want to join you? I don't know. No, if they're not on this. Oh, okay. Amendment. Okay, great. 
Minority. We welcome a summary of... Uh, I shall summarize. Thank you. As you know, uh, the Education and Workforce Committee has the preventive part and the rehabilitative part of the juvenile justice uh, bill. Uh, Congressman Greenwood and uh, Congressman Scott uh, did all the negotiating for the committee uh, and uh, did very well, I might add. Uh, the amendment makes some improvements to the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, and it's based on legislation that was introduced by Congressman Greenwood, and it uh, passed the Subcommittee on Early Childhood, Youth, and Families. Uh, during the 105th Congress, the similar legislation passed twice. Uh, passed on July 15, 1997, by a vote of 413 to 14, and then we added it uh, to S. 2073, which amended the Missing Children's Assistance Act and the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. And that was passed uh, September 15, 1998, by a vote of 280 to 126. Uh, we believe that uh, this amendment complements and completes H.R. 1501. It provides the prevention component of a sound two-pronged approach to addressing juvenile crime, accountability, and prevention. Uh, we did not mark it up in full committee. Uh, but as I indicated, uh, Congressman Greenwood and Congressman Scott uh, did all the negotiating uh, on this piece of legislation. Uh, many youth in the juvenile justice system and others at risk of delinquent behavior need additional support to ensure that they do not continue to or do not in the first place engage in criminal activities, and we think our legislation will help. Uh, the legislation makes two major changes. Uh, first and foremost, it streamlines current law, provides greater flexibility to states in meeting the four core requirements which they must comply in order to get funding. Second, it combines a variety of discretionary programs into a prevention block grant to the states, which allows states and local communities to decide the types of prevention activities they wish to support. Uh, I'm asking for 90 minutes uh, and uh, Bobby Scott is very much interested in, in the 90 minutes also. Uh, we think it's very important, otherwise this whole debate and whole discussion uh, will talk about punitive actions and there will be no discussion that will be remembered that deals with prevention and rehabilitation. So we would ask that we have 90 minutes of general debate on the amendment, uh, controlled by myself and uh, the ranking minority member of the committee. That's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That's uh, very clear, and I understand your request. Mr. Buckley? Gentlemen, Doc, any questions? So, thank you very much, Bill. Appreciate it. Previously seen in the environs, with a great suggestion at that time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to keep it short. Please, please proceed. Let me explain uh, the amendment that I seek to offer and why I seek to offer it. As you know, all of this recent round of turmoil started uh, with the unfortunate incident at the high school in Colorado. And I've been most disappointed by the reaction uh, uh, of the Congress and the country to that episode. Uh, first of all, um, we have seen uh, one party in the House propose a bill which is largely focused uh, on what appears to be the assumption that if we simply uh, uh, treat a whole lot more uh, 13 and 14 year olds as adults in our court system that we will somehow all be better off. I would simply make the point that I certainly want uh, youngsters to be uh, disciplined hard and effectively. But I would point out those two kids in Littleton who killed uh, uh, their schoolmates uh, wouldn't have been deterred by higher penalties uh, for criminal offenses. Uh, they were willing to die in order to make their statement, which I think we ought to remember when we propose remedies. Uh, then we have the other party uh, that comes in here and assumes, I guess, that uh, 
uh, we can solve all of these problems by simply dealing with guns. And the fact is, if you analyze the situation, not a single one of the incidents that, have, that we've seen in the past few months would have pre been prevented at all by any of the remedies that are being proposed on the gun front. And so it seems to me that we need to look a little more deeply. And the amendment that I'm asking you to make in order <clears throat> is based on a very simple assumption. It's based on the assumption that for almost 40 years, this country has tried to uh, hide from the fact that there are profound societal impacts when our economy changes to the point where two people from each family are, are, are uh, in the workplace, when kids come home to empty houses, uh, and uh, when parents do come home, uh, uh, they're often too tired to even talk to their kids about what has been going on that day. And to me, what we ought to be focusing on uh, uh, is uh, the issue of prevention. Uh, last year, uh, Senator Specter and I uh, worked on a, a multifaceted approach to expand preventative mental health services for children in uh, school settings. And I would ask that uh, the committee allow me to offer an amendment which would build on that experience of last year. Uh, basically, what uh, 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 my amendment would do very simply is uh, is uh, to do five things. It would expand the Safe School Healthy Students program by providing uh, some $700 million in authorization uh, uh, to en enable schools to establish comprehensive anti-violence uh, programs with a very strong uh, uh, mental uh, health component so that we can identify kids at an early age and intervene with those kids if they are showing uh, problems of, uh, of that, that people, th emotional problems that people think could lead to violence. Secondly, we would also provide expanded community action grants to assist uh, many more school districts to, uh, to put together, uh, to, to assist them with planning grants to, to, to help them if they're not as far along as some of the other schools in putting together uh, actual uh, uh, approaches of their own to deal with uh, with the problem. Thirdly, uh, we would provide uh, some assistance to help uh, uh, school districts develop ways to, to develop alternative uh, school settings for uh, uh, young people who have been expelled, who haven't uh, been functioning in regular high school settings, for instance. Fourth, uh, we would uh, expand uh, 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 greatly the, the uh, uh, 21st century community learning centers, the after school centers, uh, we have to face the fact that a huge percentage of youth crime is uh, committed uh, during the hours of uh, uh, 2 in the afternoon and 10 at night and, uh, and that's uh, largely when they don't have anything to do and are not under, uh, under adult supervision. In my mind, that is the wave of the future, and I think we ought to uh, get on board. And lastly, there are all kinds of impediments that, are, that uh, uh, crop up in the way of local schools who are trying to provide uh, mental health services, especially to low-income children, and uh, uh, who are supposed to get some help in financing those services uh, from Medicaid, for instance, but because of varying state rules, don't get the help that they're supposed to get. And to me, uh, I think uh, we ought to ask the National Academy of Sciences to, to do an examination of that problem so that we understand far better than we do today uh, what the impediments are to actually providing those services to those children. To me, uh, I offer this amendment because, frankly, I want to get out of the dialogue of the deaf that we have going on on gun control. Um, uh, I, I, I look at the gun control issue like I do abortion. We haven't had a conversation on that issue in years. We have had people screaming at each other on it from both poles. And, uh, and I don't think it does anybody any good. Uh, uh, and uh, I also uh, don't think that it uh, does a lot of good uh, uh, if we're going to take every other kid in America and treat a 14-year-old as, as an adult. Uh, 
with all uh, that that uh, implies. Uh, and it just seems to me that uh, uh, these kids, uh, uh, the kids who shot up uh, at Littleton School uh, were in far more serious shape uh, than, uh, than, uh, than uh, these kind of remedies would seem to indicate. Uh, they aren't going to be deterred by higher criminal penalties. Uh, they've got to be dealt with uh, in a far more effective and basic way. So basically, I would simply ask that you make that amendment in order. Uh, it differs from the Democratic leadership approach in that it is, it is uh, far broader and more extensive uh, than the preventative approach being offered by them. It differs from uh, the uh, Goodling uh, items that he was just here talking about because that is focused largely on juvenile justice while what I'm talking about here in virtually every instance is school-based. And since uh, the genesis of this was uh, what happened in schools, I think that's where we ought to start with the solution. Well, thank you. You've made it clear. Tragically, I think we need all of it. Uh, it seems like there's a little bit of improvement available everywhere. But I, right. I have done a lot of thinking about this. I'm sure we all have. And uh, I agree. It's, it's, it's more than just a partisan debate by a lot. And I hope we're going to do it credit. I hope this debate is going to open up all of these uh, branches and we're going to get a chance to talk about all this stuff. That's my personal view. I, I don't know what's going to happen when we get, if we should live long enough to get through all these amendments. Uh, I'm not sure which ones we're going to deal with, but uh, at any rate, we're going to try and hear them all. And thank you well, for your contribution. I hope the committee will give it some consideration. It's not a political amendment. I, I'm sure it's it will. An effort to I think get it's, out of the politics. No, I think there's merit and substance in what you said. Joe, excuse me. Thank you. 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 Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Actually, I have three amendments here. The first one uh, relates directly to the juvenile justice uh, bill, and it's related in a sense to what our previous colleague was, was speaking about, it had to do with uh, mental health questions. And actually, I was working on this amendment in terms of juvenile justice bill uh, before Littleton happened. But when it did happen, it became exhibit A of exactly what I and many others of us knew about were deficiency as in the um, juvenile justice system, particularly for those uh, young people who were on probation. And I think that uh, it's important for us to understand that, or to remember now that we know about this terrible atrocity in Littleton, that the two young men that committed that, those atrocities had just 11 weeks before been re relieved or released from the probation system under juvenile justice law with flying colors. They were told by, they, they were released by the probation officers and uh, indicated that these were fine young men in every way. And it became exhibit A for the fact that uh, the juvenile justice system, even though mental health review is part of the formula, grant formula under juvenile justice, there's no teeth in the law or accountability. So what my amendment would do would put uh, accountability into existing law and so that the formula grants would be based on the melting of the care on the four, four care requirements. It would simply require the states to make mental health services available within two legislative sessions of the state legislature. And it would, um, n it is not considered a mandate. First, because CBO has said in a letter that it is not a mandate. And second, the states choose by their own selection process to b take part in the juvenile justice uh, program. And so uh, thirdly, the states would have two legislative sessions to implement uh, a health program, a mental health program, and they could apply for an extension under this if they just uh, simply state that they have not been able to comply with that, that uh, time period. But I think uh, what we what we have to recognize is that this is putting formula grant money into the purposes for which it was intended, not for pony rides or trips to Disneyland, which, believe it or not, is the way some of this money is now currently being spent. 
And I would like to point out, and I will include it in the record, all the groups that are supporting this, the National League of Cities, National Association of Counties, over 500 police chiefs, sheriffs and prosecutors, American Bar Association, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the United Way, et cetera, and there are other groups, and I will submit that for the record. My other amendment, Mr. Chairman, relates to the gun shows, and it has to do with, um, of course, in fact, it is the uh, a combined amendment with uh, Carolyn McCarthy, Congresswoman McCarthy, and myself, and uh, it is our intention to close the gun show loophole that is in the bill as we presently have it. And I must tell you uh, a couple of things about this. First of all, it does nothing more than bring us into line with exactly what the Senate passed in terms of defining what a gun show is and the background checks. And there is no national registry here. It is simply a background check uh, for a period of time uh, that relates to um, a, a three-day three waiting period for background checks and um, will require those background checks to be done by gun show, the independent operators at these gun shows, where there are 10, ten uh, gun, show, gun performers or more. It is, I must emphasize, all the details of it are here, but I must emphasize it puts in place exactly what the Senate did, and it is not a national registration. It is kept for a 90-day period, as, uh, as uh, is understood to be the need for, um, by the, the uh, police, police for the kinds of needs that they have to do, and to really truly say to these gun show operators who are obviously now, we have large records of where they are selling gun sh guns illegally by the hundreds to people that under ordinary law would not be legally uh, eligible for gun purchases. And it also, they also are going uh, across state lines and illegally uh, selling guns. Uh, the third... Um, and I, I could go into a, a description of how uh, Eric, Eric Harris was uh, especially the one who obtained a D, TEC-9 assault weapon uh, illegally through one of these gun, gun dealers. And even in Oklahoma City bombers, if you remember back to them, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols sold over $60,000 in stolen weapons at gun shows to finance the killings that they did in the Oklahoma City bombing. There are all kinds of evidence now that this needs to be tightened up and there has to be genuine uh, review and background checks so that criminals are not making illegal uh, business out of selling guns at gun shows. And um, I certainly, in the National Alliance of Stock Gun Dealers, which represents the largest number of gun dealers, have endorsed the amendment. And I'll tell you, if you speak to anyone who's a federally registered gun dealer, they would say, yes, this is a terrible abuse and it's a growing abuse. But again, it's simply putting us back into the position of the Senate language. And then finally, there is another uh, study, I'm, I'm sorry, there is another amendment that I am co-sponsoring with Mr. Markey, and that's an FTC study amendment, and it would be Representative Markey, Barrett, and myself, and it, uh, the amendment directs the Federal Trade Commission and the Attorney General to conduct a study of the marketing practices of the firearms industry with respect to children. Uh, the language is identical to our amendment and that was included in the Senate Juvenile Justice Bill by a voice vote last May. So it is also consistent. It has to do with magazine ads and internet and the way they are marketing guns to children. And uh, I think it, I think we could say it's a companion piece, in my opinion, to the cultural studies of the Hyde McCollum proposal. I think this is something that can well be understood in, turn, in the context of what they are trying to do, and it requires an FTC study of uh, the marketing of guns to young people. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I uh, conclude my testimony. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Rockman. We um, 
We'll accept, uh, of course, uh, without objection for the record, all your prepared statements. And we have the amendments. The, uh, there are several other people who have got amendments in, in similar subjects and related areas, obviously. And I think I found all yours in this, this pile. So I might far. just add, I, I should have uh, dropped a couple of names here because I think they're important names. Uh, when I mentioned this uh, study, the study of the last uh, amendment, uh, Senators Hatch and, Senators, and Senator Brownback accepted this amendment or presented this amendment on the floor of the Senate. <coughs> and I think it would be appropriate for us to include and take their leadership here. Thank you. Ms. Bob? <coughs> <coughs> Without objection. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Myrick, a question. Ms. Slaughter. I don't have any questions, but I want to commend you, March. I will work in a certain amount. Thank you. And I would hope that Carolyn McCarthy will be coming up and giving her perspective on this at a later time. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Honorable Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle, welcome back, sir. I uh, have a very official looking note here that says that a Mr. James Oberstar of Minnesota, who may be detained, uh, ironically enough, because of aviation problems, uh, and Mr. Charles Stenholm of Texas, uh, we're going to join you. Is that accurate? That is accurate, Mr. Chairman. Would you wish to wait for them or do you wish to proceed? Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that, 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 that it would probably be better that I just simply proceeded. Please do, sir. Uh, Chairman, I think you probably better off Mr. Robinson said he was stuck in Minneapolis. So, he and I fly the same airline between here and there, and we know something about delays. And, and all of you as frequent flyers understand the, the problems that we have with weather and other things when, when one flies an airline. Um, Mr. Chairman, first of all, thank you for your courtesy to me. I express my thanks also to the members of the committee. I have a brief statement rather than, than extrapolate which will take longer, I will give the whole statement because it is so brief. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, the possession and use of firearms by law-abiding citizens of our nation is based on the traditional guarantees of our Constitution. It's long been a matter of very special concern to me as a shooter and as one who has raised a family of kids who are now raising grandkids. All of us enjoy the use of firearms for legitimate sporting and defense purposes, and we've been extremely careful, and uh, we, have, we have shown that that uh, proper use of firearms is something which can draw a family together rather than to uh, commit evil. My, my children were taught early gun safety and they understood the things which are important about not only the proper use of firearms but frankly the sporting values that come from that use. On numerous occasions during the years I've served in the House, I've had the privilege of sponsoring bills which would further the peaceful and, enjoy and legitimate enjoyment of shooting and shooting activities by citizens of good repute, both as a sport and a hobby, and in the interest of our national defense. And sportsmen do make massive contributions, both in terms of safety, by contributing to the tax rolls, large sums of money, which are earmarked specifically for hunter safety and training in, in the use of firearms and firearms safety. I've also uh, endeavored to pass uh, legislation and to stress the necessity of penalizing the wrongdoer who misuses the gun. In following that tradition, I come today before you to ask you to make an order, an amendment that, I've, that I will be offering with your leave, uh, with Messrs. Oberstar, Stenholm, Tanner, Kramer, and John, and a number of others of our colleagues who will join us in that undertaking. Our amendment is a sensible means to forever close the gun show loophole while at the same time ensuring law-abiding citizens' right to purchase firearms is uninfringed. And I would point out that uh, gun shows properly conducted and participated in by legitimate businessmen, sportsmen, uh, and registered dealers uh, are a great source of recreation and no hurt to the American people. Our amendment will do four things. One, it defines what constitutes a proper sale at a gun show in a manner consistent with established contract law. I would point out to you, Mr. Chairman, that the uh, legislation without this amendment now uh, makes it now completely stands contract law on its ear and imposes enormous unneeded hardship on legitimate sportsmen and citizens. 
It directs the FBI to prioritize background checks at gun shows. It uh, deters the theft of firearms being shipped through the mail. And it increases the penalties for those who use guns with large capacity um, magazines in the commission of crime. I respectfully request that the perfecting amendment be permitted to be offered to the Hyde McCollum Juvenile Justice Legislation that the House will, I'm informed, consider later this week, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Thank you. As promised, you explained it briefly and clearly. I thank you very much. Uh, I don't think there was any surprise there, Mr. Oakley. Thank you. You've honored us thank very you, well. Mr. Chairman. Uh, we will certainly consider your request. As I'm I sure feel you this is something of a reward for my good behavior on this earlier occasion today before the committee. <laughs> We thank you for coming this evening very much. Uh, at this time, um, yeah, if, if Porter Goss were here, we'd call him. But since he's not, we'll call Bob Franks. Mr. Franks, gentleman from New Jersey. And then I think we go to Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, members of the committee. Mr. Chairman, over 15 million children today have access to the Internet. Within seconds, they can find up-to-date information on every conceivable topic that they might be studying in school. But this extraordinarily powerful learning tool can also have a dark and threatening side. Pedophiles and other criminals are using the Internet to contact our children in the places where we want to believe they are most secure, in our homes, in our schools, and in our libraries. The reality is that materials breeding hate, violence, Pornography and even personal danger are only a few clicks away. Cyber Angels, a computer-savvy affiliate of the Guardian Angels, has documented more than 17,000 Internet sites devoted to child pornography and pedophilia. The FBI today reports that pornography sites are literally the most frequently accessed sites on the Internet. Despite these concerns, I believe that every child in America should have access to this amazing learning tool, provided that we take reasonable and prudent steps to protect our children. That's why I would like to offer the Children's Internet Protection Act as an amendment to the Juvenile Justice Bill, along with my colleague, Chip Pickering. This amendment would require schools and libraries to use filtering technology if they accept E-rate funds to connect to the Internet filtering technology which many parents have already installed in their home computers would keep materials designed for adults only out of the reach of our children. The concept of placing restrictions on the kind of information available to our children is not a new one. For generations, schools and libraries have routinely decided what books are appropriate for children to read. The Children's Internet Protection Act would merely require that these same institutions exercise that same standard of care when it comes to the latest advances of the information age. While the bill requires schools and libraries to use blocking technology, it leaves it up to the local school district and local library board to determine the type of filtering technology to use. It's important that parents and local educators in our own local communities set these standards. This amendment will ensure that our children can take advantage of the Internet without being assaulted by materials that are not only inappropriate, but dangerous for our children. I hope that the committee will consider this amendment. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, let me say I'm going to be offering some amendments that deal with the issue of character education. Many of the items that have been brought before the committee thus far talk about substantive changes in our law. I think to help avoid and to help minimize violence in our schools, we need to see some changes of the heart. And that's why I believe it's appropriate for the Congress to take steps to spur an increase in the amount of character education courses that are being offered throughout our nation's public schools. The in a number of hours uh, that people are uh, in front of this new technology or involved with this new technology. It's an amazing part of it. Questions? Thank you very much, Frank. Um, I uh, understand that we have a member of the committee uh, in the room who missed the earlier call, Mr. Nadler. But uh, as a courtesy to members of the committee, uh, normally we will go back and uh, recover any who do show up, so you are called. And I also know you have a couple of amendments which I presume you want to talk to. Yes. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Ranking Member Mokley, uh, other members. Uh, I'm here today to urge two things. Uh, first, to urge that you, what probably you won't do, but I hope you do, report an open rule for the consideration of the juvenile justice legislation, because if that would it was be not which century. Would you like to finish it? Well, I'll simply say that because the committee did not vet this bill, did not consider the bill, and therefore did not go through the amendments, uh, that would be an appropriate thing to do. I understand there are practical considerations. Failing that, I have three amendments which would deal with specific aspects of the wide and unregulated availability of firearms in this country. My first amendment, which I have entitled Ari's Law, would treat the sale and possession of certain key gun parts as firearms by including those parts in the definition of firearm for the purposes of Title 18. It is intended to deal with a loophole exploited by the sellers of so-called gun kits through the mail. They sell parts and instructions from which the buyer can make a weapon and this is done solely to evade the normal checks and registration associated with selling a gun. There's no legitimate purpose to this loophole, and the amendment would close it. It would close the loophole for people like the terrorist who shot out Ari Halberstam on the Brooklyn Bridge in an attack aimed at him and his classmates simply because they were identifiably Jewish. The individual is convicted of that murder, purchased a gun kit through the mail with fewer restrictions than if he were purchasing a prescription decongestant or a 10-year-old Chevy. This is outrageous. And the sole reason for these gun kits through the, being sold through the mail is to evade the laws and we ought to close that loophole. I invite any member of the committee who has questions about these gun kits to look at some of the advertisements the manufacturers have run to sell them, making clear that its purpose is to avoid current law and the sale and possession of firearms. We should close the gun kit loophole. So all this amendment would do is to say that in effect, you, by changing certain definitions, say that you cannot sell kits from which you can make a gun without any of the, and evading the normal restrictions on sales of guns. The second amendment uh, would prevent the assault, the importation of assault weapons that have been cosmetically altered to avoid the technical definitions of the federal ban on semi-automatic assault weapons. It's based on a bill that I've introduced, the Assault Weapons Ban Enhancement Act, H.R. 1809. Foreign firearms manufacturers and U.S. gun importers have a history of evading restrictions on guns and of designing rule beaters to circumvent any ban. The Violence Policy Center has identified various loopholes in the 1994 assault weapons ban and recent rulings by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, uh, Firearms and Tobacco that have now allowed gun manufacturers to cosmetically alter their weapons in order to avoid the ban altogether. This amendment is designed to close these loopholes. Uh, we have witnessed in gun shows and advertisements on the internet and in magazines a new brand of assault weapon specifically designed to avoid the ban, but still lethal, still potentially harmful to the American public, and still very much in reality assault weapons. The BATF has recently approved a new weapon, the VEPR. The, we fear that gun makers will use the VEPR as a prototype of a new generation of weapons that seek to avoid the ban and flood the U.S. market with high-powered, deadly assault rifles. Assault rifles, in fact, but technically evading the 1994 uh, legal definition. This amendment would stop the importation of guns that have been determined to be assault weapons, except for the fact that they had a thumbhole stock instead of a pistol group. It would stop guns that can be easily modified to accept high-capacity magazines. Some guns would still make it past this amendment. Regular sporting rifles and weapons that cannot be modified to accept large capacity magazines would still be able to be imported. The amendment is designed to strengthen an already good law and to prevent manufacturers from evading the assault weapons ban. It's designed to head off the influx of this next generation of weapons before they're used in the next round of deadly violence. The final amendment is based on a bill first introduced by now Senator Schumer and myself back in January of 1996. The amendment is being offered by Representative Wexler, Representative Moran and myself, and I believe the Representative Wexler will testify in further detail about the amendment. Essentially, it would limit handgun purchases to one a month. Opponents of reasonable gun control point to places like New York City or Washington. That's why we have so many shootings if we have such strict gun control laws. Frankly, our police, anyone can walk into a store in Florida right now buy a box of guns, or for that matter, a hundred guns, and be back on our streets the next day selling those guns illegally on the black market to children or anyone else who can come up with the money. And that's what happens. The strict gun control laws of places like New York City and Washington are evaded by people who go to states with lax or no gun control laws like Chicago, like, I'm sorry, like Florida, 
buy up a large quantity of weapons, drive back up IS, IS uh, Interstate 95, and then sell them on the black market. If you were limited to purchasing, to selling one gun a month to an individual, then obviously the economics would change and the states, this is a bill designed to enable states to enforce their laws. It's a, it's a way for the federal government to aid the states in enforcing, in enforcing their laws. The bill poses, or the amendment poses no threat to private individuals who want to purchase firearms. I defy anyone to give me a legitimate reason why a married couple would need to buy more than 24 handguns in a year or amass an arsenal of 241 guns over a decade. This is a common sense measure that addresses straw purchases and reduces sale of guns to criminals. Um, I hope this committee will make these three amendments in order under the rule, and I thank you for your consideration. I thank you very much. I'll put you down for an open rule and three good amendments. Mr. Moakley? Thanks very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, now I believe that does complete the testimony of the members of the Judiciary Committee. And we will get back to the uh, others category, and I think um, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hostetler, is uh, next in line. Welcome your comment. We accept your prepared statement uh, without objection for the record, and uh, we uh, would like to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the Rules Committee. Uh, I'm offering, asking for two amendments to be made in order under the rule, uh, the first of which dealing with uh, uh, legislation that would add the element of intent to do harm to the gun-free school zones possession prohibition. Because we're asking for more pro prosecution in existing gun laws, <clears throat> we want to clarify that these laws are consistent with our pursuit to ensure the diligent prosecution of those who endanger our children. The law in its present form holds with few exceptions individuals strictly liable for possessing any firearm if they happen to find themselves in a school zone. With this amendment, all the activities allowed under current law would still be allowed. However, we would be assured of prosecuting those that deserve prosecution, not those lacking any intent to do harm. Examples of those could be prosecuted without this amendment. For example, under this law, heroes like Vice Principal Joel Myrick of Pearl, Mississippi, could find themselves prosecuted for defending the lives of our children under the law as it is today. Vice Principal Myrick would not have fallen into any of the exceptions under the law today. His handgun was legally in his car under the laws of Mississippi. However, he was in violation of this vague federal law. Under the law, a parent who has just come from hunting to pick up a child but hasn't secured his shotgun in a lockbox is in violation of federal law. In Indiana, the law recognizes all other states' handgun licenses. So if a legally licensed person from a neighboring state finds himself on school property in Indiana, he would be in jeopardy under federal law as it is today. Recently, a child in my district brought a Civil War unloaded cap and ball pistol onto school grounds. The pistol was in his car and he had no ammunition. Should he go to jail? Of course not. This amendment does not mandate how schools handle discipline. If a school wants to develop a zero tolerance policy, obviously they are free to do so. My second amendment would make sure that individuals are not required to submit to a national InstaCheck system check for private transfers. My amendment simply clarifies that if an American wants to transfer a gun to a neighbor, a friend, or a family member, they will still enjoy that freedom without a licensed firearms dealer. The truth is, in this day and age, gun owners just will not transfer a firearm to someone they do not know without an InstaCheck. I just want to make sure that collectors and family members are not burdened if this law should be put in effect. Thank you very much. Very clear. You, Any questions? I think not. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your interest and participation. Thank you. We go to the uh, gentlelady who has been most patient from Hawaii, Pat Zemeek. I'm sorry, I've been following the protocols, and uh, you've been here longer. I'm if we were doing it on time, <laughs> time here. Thank you very much. You. Well, it only emphasizes the importance of my testimony that I stayed this line. I do appreciate your indulgence. I um, serve on the uh, Education and Workforce Committee, and as you know, we have jurisdiction over portions of the juvenile justice bill having to do primarily with rehabilitation and prevention, as the chairman of our committee indicated earlier. 
Uh, we've had many uh, discussions, task force meetings, hearings on this whole subject of school violence in particular. And it seems to us that one of the very uh, immediate ways in which we could uh, help this situation within these schools is to try to provide sufficient service personnel which the students themselves could have an outreach to discuss their personal problems, their needs. The parents would also have access to these individuals and the teachers as well. It seems to us with the uh, <clears throat> violence that we have uh, witnessed over the last uh, recent months that uh, this type of service to the students is uh, very, very uh, much needed. We're not talking about school counselors. We've discussed this matter in terms of school counselors, and we find that there are <clears throat> 90,000 school counselors for some uh, 41 million students, a ratio of 1 to 450. School counselors have other duties. They have administrative duties, scheduling. They have to do uh, with uh, job placements and college placements and all of the intricacies that uh, relate to that type of uh, counseling. And so what we are suggesting is that there be a different kind of personnel placed in, in the schools, particularly in the middle schools, where we think young people are probably in greatest uh, need of some uh, personal attention not just peer attention among themselves, but someone that they could go to, a mentor in, in effect. And we think that this addition of this personnel is extremely important. It would give this um, personnel a chance to uh, talk to the students, to the parents, be alert to the early warning signals that uh, could come up in the interac interaction with these students. It goes to safe schools, it goes to the whole idea of help for our students. And Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> the bill that I believe we're considering, although I'm not exactly sure which one we are dealing with, I think it's H.R. 1501, provides the easy mechanism for the addition of this um, uh, purpose. Because in part R, we have the accountability block grant program, and under it, are now in the legislation 13 <clears throat> authorized activities. And all my amendment does is to add a 14th authorized purpose. It doesn't mandate, it doesn't require, it doesn't add an obligation. But it says to the states, here is a permitted use of the funds that you're going to be allocated. It doesn't increase the funding at this point, but it says that the schools may uh, acquire this additional personnel for the purposes uh, that I uh, indicated. Our amendment was submitted as uh, suggested to the, um, to the record. It has been printed. I hope that in considering all the variety of amendments that you have had suggested today with regard to the uh, mental health uh, uh, situation involving our students, that you will consider this as a very simple, modest way of allowing the states to, uh, uh, to utilize the funds that they are otherwise being allocated in the legislation to uh, this particular purpose of providing this additional help to the students, the parents, and the teachers. And I believe it will go a long way towards meeting the objectives that have been discussed uh, in uh, numerous meetings and hearings that we've held on this whole subject of school violence. So I hope that you will make and order this amendment and allow it to uh, come to the floor for debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I believe that we are talking about our amendment number 78, which uh, Mr. Stupak also joined. Yes, Mr. That's Stupak correct. and I are co-sponsors of this amendment. Thank you. Obviously know a great deal about this subject. We've given a good deal of thought and, Thank you. Uh, and helped uh, educate me. I appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. No comment? Louise? Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I apologize to Mr. Markey. I uh, see I have you in a panel also. Uh, with Mrs. Rockham, uh, who has already been here, would you uh, care to testify further? Do you mind? No, please, if you Thank would. You. Uh, it's uh, obviously been a little confusing juggling all the names. And uh, I have you uh, with, with Mr. Barrett and 
Ms. Rockema? That's correct. Yes. Uh, with the amendment with regard to the, uh, the study of the firearms okay. industry, is that correct? That's correct. And I have a couple of other amendments as well, Mr. Chairman. That, uh, uh, that will be fine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and I appreciate your indulgence. Um, Mrs. Rockema has already uh, testified on an amendment that we seek to have placed in order, uh, which would uh, establish the uh, creation of a study that would be conducted by the Federal Trade Commission and the Attorney General to look at the practices of marketing by gun manufacturers uh, towards the children in our country. Uh, what we find now in searching throughout the literature are ads like this or articles like this, Mr. Chairman, that basically say, start them young. There is no time like the present. And uh, with the proliferation of, of means of access to uh, children over the internet and other media today, uh, I think it's important for us to uh, look at this uh, phenomenon and to uh, put limitations upon it where appropriate. And uh, uh, Mrs. Rochmer and I, along with Mr. Barrett from Wisconsin, uh, are requesting that this amendment be put in order. Uh, uh, Mrs. Boxer successfully made this amendment in the Senate, made it to the extent to which um, uh, Mr. Hatch and uh, Mr. Brownback accepted it as a, a major contribution to the Senate effort. I think it's something that kind of gets at the core what people are concerned about, which is how children are uh, targeted. Secondly, uh, Mr. Burton of Indiana and I uh, seek to have placed in order an amendment which would uh, uh, lead to the uh, institution of a, uh, an update of the Surgeon General study. Uh, on the correlation of youth violence and media in our society. Uh, there has not been a study done on this subject by the Surgeon General since 1972. Uh, there has not been any sub, uh, study done on the subject uh, by the federal government since 1982. The NIH uh, did a study. Let me just give you a good idea of how out of date we are already. Here's uh, the opening paragraph from the 1982 study. We must recognize that children are growing up in an, in an environment in which they must learn to organize experiences and emotional responses, not only in relationship to the physical and social environment of the home, but also in relation to the omnipresent 21-inch screen that talks, sings, dances, and encourages the desires for toys, candies, and breakfast foods. The reference to the omnipresent 21-inch screen now seems quaint in the era of the internet. Uh, we have moved far beyond that point in terms of what it is that children in our society have access to. Uh, President Clinton has already announced that he is going to have the Surgeon General uh, conduct this updated study. Uh, I request, as does Mr. Burton, that this amendment be placed in order uh, so that Congress be put on record uh, requesting that the same study be done. And finally, Again, Mr. Burton of Indiana, this is his amendment. I am making the proposal for him, uh, along with Representative Tierney from Massachusetts, um, uh, 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 making this request at this time. I have Mr. Burton's statement, which I would ask unanimous consent to be placed in the record. Um, this is, um, I think, a very important um, uh, study. It's a commission, actually. Um, uh, Senator McCain and Senator Lieberman have uh, included this uh, commission uh, into the Senate uh, bill. And I think it's important for the House to speak on this issue as well. Back in the 1960s, at the height of the riots in the inner cities of the United States, uh, a commission was constructed, the Kerner Commission, which uh, uh, did an, an enormous amount of good work by establishing uh, the facts that uh, helped to create uh, not only a better understanding of what was leading to the social unrest in the inner city, but also the kinds of programs that could be instituted that could reduce the likelihood that they would be repeated. What we're asking for here today is for the creation of uh, a new commission on the study of uh, youth violence. Uh, and uh, 
rather than just focusing upon one subject or another and targeting them for a scarlet letter. Instead, what Mr. Burton uh, does in his commission, and I support him in this effort, is to look at a, a range of factors. One, study the perpetrators of school shootings. Two, the level of teacher and school administrator involvement. Three, the level of parental involvement. Four, the alienation of youth from school and family and peers. Five, the availability of firearms to youth. Six, the level of enforcement of existing laws to restrict youth access to guns. Seven, the effect of depictions of violence in the media uh, on youth violence. And eight, the availability of information to construct bombs or weapons. Uh, the commission uh, will be a body that is equally balanced between Democrats and Republicans, the executive and the congressional branch, and the House uh, and the Senate. It would take testimony from citizens and from experts, and at the end of 18 months, make a report to the President, to the Congress, and to the American people. Uh, this is not a short-term program. It will take at least 18 months to construct. But we think by looking at all of the factors, uh, we will have a better picture of, of what's going on in our society, the influences on young people, uh, and the uh, and the things that we might be able to do across the board. And I think to a large extent what Mr. Burton is trying to do, as am I, uh, is to construct an environment in, we can, in which we can proportionately uh, uh, assess the responsibility rather than one party or another, one uh, interest group or another, uh, trying to pass the Queen of Spades on to uh, another uh, uh, entity within our society for fear that they might take the full burden of all of, of the responsibility themselves. We think this is a good amendment. Mr. McCain and Mr. Lieberman were able to have it adopted unanimously in the Senate. Uh, we would hope that the same would happen here in the House. Thank you. My understanding is that this commission would sunset once it had done its job. That is correct. Thank you. It's very clear. Do you have questions on this? Louise? Uh, uh, Ms. Myrick, any questions on this? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, very much. I apologize for I getting it. things out of order. You've been here. more than gracious to me. Thank you, sir. Mr. Radonovich of California. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Statement will be accepted without objection for the record. We Thank you. Welcome your remarks. We know you have uh, some amendments for us, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this opportunity to speak about the Radonovich Thompson Amendment to the Juvenile Offenders Act. This amendment, supported by a bipartisan group of over 40 House members, was written to provide an effective enforcement mechanism to prevent the shipment of alcoholic beverages to underage individuals. The Radonovich Thompson Amendment addresses the core issue of preventing juvenile crime and penalizes producers when minors receive alcohol shipments. Specifically, the amendment makes it a federal violation for producers, such as a brewery or a winery, to sell and ship alcoholic beverages to an underage person. The language gives the Department of the Treasury the ability to impose civil penalties of up to $10,000 against the producer if a minor receives a shipment of alcohol. Also, the package containing the alcohol beverage must have a label stating that an adult signature is required upon delivery. This new law would be enforced by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. An amendment, a different amendment entitled uh, the 21st Amendment Enforcement Act, uh, submitted by my colleague Mr. Scarborough, has also been submitted in an attempt to address this issue. It falls short by not effectively discouraging underage drinking. It gives the federal courts, after the fact, jurisdiction to issue injunctions to prohibit future actions. The language of the amendment does not even mention children, youth, minors, juvenile crime, or underage drinking. Furthermore, injunctive relief is about economic advantage, not criminal enforcement. Outside groups pressing for the adoption of the injunctive relief approach are not prompted primarily by the concern about juvenile crime or underage drinking. Rather, they are seeking to maintain and enhance their existing unfair, anti-competitive marketplace advantage over producers. Even in those states where direct shipments to adults under carefully prescribed circumstances are lawful, the real result of injunctive relief amendment will be a higher prices for consumers and less consumer choice. I believe the Radonovich Thompson Amendment establishes appropriate measures to ensure minors do not receive shipments of intoxicating beverages. The producer is accurately 
held responsible in preventing underage alcohol consumption, and held liable if a minor receives a shipment. By discouraging underage drinking, the language is an important addition to H.R. 1501. And uh, I appreciate your, your remarks. Uh, actually, we had uh, some similar remarks uh, from Joe Scarborough. Right. And you have uh, probably chatted with him about some approaches to this, I would think. Yeah, it's, uh, it's my desire that uh, that amendment not be included in this I, rule. I, I would understand that. And, and uh, uh, I tried to ask him some questions that sort of brought out your perspective on it a little bit, um, and I'm not sure I succeeded very well. What I would hope is that in having, instead of having two opposing ones, there might be a way for you two to work together. I don't know. Well, I do know that uh, there are, this issue has been divided into two areas. One has been underage drinking, which my bill effectively um, uh, approaches, and also a Feinstein measure in the Senate version uh, addresses the issue of underage drinking. The other issue is, is an intra-industry intra um, uh, battle with wholesalers seeking protection against the Internet and other types of 21st century commerce. That's an access issue that we want to work out in the industry. So. Uh, I, agree it, it's not I think we're all the same on the underage drinking. I think it's it's the industry problem that needs uh, needs attention. And and we agree that the underage uh, drinking issue should should and will be addressed in this bill. Our concern is the access issue is not a, is not sufficiently addressed. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, Thank you. Questions, uh, Mr. Hayes. I, I just uh, have a comment. I know that this issue, uh, when you deal with certain industries, sometimes you have. Uh, opposing views and uh, there doesn't seem to be any middle ground sometimes and to me that's disturbing because nobody really wins in a situation like this where one side is trying to get this position another side is getting uh, uh, you know their position and at the end um, uh, there are losers I think on both sides I, I would just uh, hope to uh, reiterate what uh, the uh, chairman or ranking chairman said just a moment ago of getting together on this if you, if you can. And I know with your background, obviously, in a, as a winery and, and uh, uh, in that business, I would just hope that you could sit down and try to work this thing out someplace so that all sides can be uh, mutually uh, uh, compromised, if you will, if that's the right word, because it has to be compromised on both sides. But at the end of the day, everybody will get, hopefully, what they, what they want. And, uh, and we can, in fact, uh, uh, have win-win in this situation. So I would hope that, that you could do that, and I commend you for the work that you've been doing thus far on this. And, and I appreciate your comments, um, Doc. I think that the best way to ensure that uh, all people in the industry get down and resolve this issue is to have neither my amendment or the Scarborough amendment on the rule. That would be the best way to approach that. Your, your point is well made in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, George. Thank you. Gainson of Connecticut. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, welcome to our humble. Well, I like your new lights. Committee and room and little lit up speakers. I'll try to be brief. I know you've got a lot of witnesses, and I appreciate the time you're giving me. If you have any additional questions on the way home, you can stop in, and I'll I'll answer them. Since I'll yell neighbor. across the back fence. <laughs> the uh, what I'm requesting is uh, an amendment uh, be made in order to uh, help. Uh, uh, train young people to avoid uh, violence. Uh, uh, this uh, legislation is to provide grants, uh, about 15 million um, grants each uh, over five-year period. And uh, one of the th reasons I think this is important is when you look at the statistics, 160,000 kids uh, miss class every day because they fear physical harm. Uh, more than a third of teenage boys say they have a gun or they can get a gun in less than a day. And every study, and I think studies are important, we can always learn more, but the studies have already told us uh, that by the time kids reach adolescence, they've already developed patterns for resolving disputes. If those um, patterns, whether a result of a uh, bad home environment or television or the Internet, uh, rely on violence, uh, it's often too late for many years to help rescue these kids. And so I think one of the great things about our federal system is that we don't have to try a solution nationwide in, in, in the 50 states and every county in our territories, that using the federal system, we can encourage a number of the best proposals and then make an assessment uh, 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 in the end. And so I think violence prevention is something 
and that everybody's focusing on. I think there are some good programs of having kids resolve disputes, whether it's kids kind of courts or, or dialogues about how to properly resolve anger and disputes that are out there. We ought to let the department choose among the best of them so we get uh, a quick answer on what works and what we can start to do uh, at an early, early age. Okay, great. Sesame Street works. I think we got to go further. <laughs> I think you got it right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Diaz Villar. Well, question very clear. Thank Please. you. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you. Thanks. See you across the fence. Thanks. Okay. It's a deal. Please to uh, take your prepared statement, uh, accept it into the record without objection, and listen to your comments. All right. Thank remarks. you very much, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight, and I will be brief. I know that that uh, always it. always uh, bodes well. Uh, Congressman Kurt Weldon of Pennsylvania and Adam Smith of Washington are joining me in offering this amendment, which is known as Amy's Law. According to the Department of Justice, the average time actually served by a rapist released from state prison is just five and a half years. For molesting a child, it's about four years. And for murder, just eight years. Light sentences for today's most heinous crimes contribute to an epidemic of completely preventable crimes. Consider, each year more than 14,000 murders, rapes, and sex crimes against children are committed by previously convicted and released murderers and sex offenders. In some 1,700 of these cases every year, the second crime occurs in a state different from that one that released the predator. We need to restore accountability. We hear a lot in government circles, especially when politicians give their speeches about personal responsibility, but I think we, we forget how important it is for government to be responsible and accountable as well. Amy's law would add an additional factor to the existing formula for distributing federal crime funds to the states. Specifically, the amendment would provide additional funding to states that convict a murderer, rapist, or child molester if that criminal had been previously convicted of one of those same crimes in a different state. The cost of prosecuting and incarceration the criminal will be deducted from the federal crime funds that go to the first state and instead will be sent to the state that obtained the second conviction. A safe harbor would not require the funds transfer if the criminal had served 85 percent of his original sentence and if the first state was a truth in sentencing state with a higher than average typical sentence of the crime. This bipartisan amendment is identical language that passed in the U.S. Senate last month as the Santorum Amendment to the Senate Juvenile Crime Bill S-254. The vote on the amendment was 82 to 17. Amy's Law is enthusiastically supported by the National Fraternal Order of Police, Child Help USA, Kloss Kids Foundation, and more than 40 other law enforcement and victims' rights groups nationwide. Chairman Bill McCollum, who held a hearing on the legislation in the House Subcommittee on Crime, he supports it. It has over 80 bipartisan co-sponsors in the, in the House, including seven committee chairmen, the majority whip, six members of this committee, and seven Judiciary Committee members. Even Dr. Lara has joined our team, urging its passage in her number one ranked radio show, urging her 18 million listeners to monitor the vote this week. And there's a call to action on her national website this week as well. So if you start getting floods of phone calls, uh, blame me. I have never met Amy Willard for whom this legislation is named. But I've become very close with her family, particularly her mother. Amy was raped and murdered in Pennsylvania by a murderer who was released from another state. Her loss was completely preventable. If her killer had just been kept in prison, at least 85% of his sentence. Amy was an all-American college athlete who wanted to work with children. We'll never know all that we lost when she was taken from us. But we should do what we can to prevent others from needlessly following her to an early grave. Let's pass this amendment this week and strike a blow against revolving door prisons and for murderers and sexual predators. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I uh, very much appreciate your, the intensity of your testimony, and uh, I sympathize very much with it. And I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of your legislation. Thank you. Do we have any uh, comment? I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. And I commend you for your hard work and determination and perseverance on this issue. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, 
there are several members of the committee who have amendments. Um, since we are here anyway, what I suggest is that uh, we pass on and let the members who have come. Is that all right with you, Louise, or not? We'll, we'll be. <laughs> we'll see if we can find a special category for Maybe rules members. <laughs> having, having said that, uh, I will then take the hand and uh, the honorable uh, gentlewoman from New York, Anita Lowy. Okay, what? Yes, well, she's been here waiting a long time. Whatever is, I would be delighted to yield to my colleague from New York. Well, I was, we've got, we're surrounded by uh, gentle quick. ladies from New York and with good amendments, but uh, since you're going to be sitting here and since maybe Nita would like since to get on. Since you're a member of my class, Mr. Chairman, I'm delighted to appear before you and members of the committee and I thank you for allowing me to testify before you today in support of amendment number 122. I'm actually here on behalf of myself Mr. Chairman and Congressman Roy, Rod Blagojevich who is not able to be here this evening and I have a statement from Mr. Blagojevich that I would like to submit for the record. Without objection. As you recall, I came before this committee several weeks ago to ask that you make a gun safety amendment in order for consideration during the legislative branch appropriations bill. You did not make an order my amendment that day, and I assume because you believe that the legislative branch appropriations bill was not the most appropriate vehicle for consideration of the amendment. And I come back to you today with roughly the same proposal, but this time as an amendment to H.R. 1501, a bill that is generally accepted as an appropriate form in which to consider gun safety legislation. The Blagojevich Lowy Amendment closes a loophole, Mr. Chairman, in our gun laws. Right now it is illegal for a federally licensed firearms dealer to sell a handgun to anyone under the age of 21. But an unlicensed dealer, <coughs> excuse me, either at a gun show or over the internet, can sell the very same handgun to a person between the ages of 18 and 21. So if you're 20, you can't buy a handgun at, gun at a gun shop, but you can walk right down the block to a gun show and buy all the handguns you want. And that very same 19 or 20 year old can own that gun legally. To me, that makes no sense at all. It's a loophole, plain and simple. And what this amendment does is close that loophole by putting the same requirements on unlicensed dealers that we put on licensed dealers. And it says you have to be 21 to own a gun. There has been some discussion that Chairman Hyde may offer an amendment that prohibits unlicensed firearm dealers from selling handguns to anyone under 21. And while I commend Mr. Hyde for supporting that part of the Blagojevich Lowy provision, I want to make it clear that a very critical aspect of Blagojevich Lowy, which is not expected to be included in Chairman Hyde's amendment, is increasing the age at which an individual can own a handgun from 18 to 21. It is simple common sense amendment, and I ask that the rule for H.R. 1501 make consideration of the Blagojevich Lowy Amendment in order, and I thank the chairman and the committee for your consideration. I thank you for your patience and uh, for your very clear articulation of what you're trying to accomplish. You're right, we did discuss it before, and I remember it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nate. Thank you very much. Distinguished gentleman, uh, Mr. Womp, leaping out of his chair, ready to testify. How can we stop that? We can. Thank Someone you, Mr. Tennessee Chairman. Tennessee is welcome. Your I prepared will, uh, remarks will be accepted in the record without objection. We welcome your comments. That's exactly what I'll do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. You know the problem, so I won't, I'll cut my testimony short and just say that it's empirical that mass media influences like video games, movies, TV shows, CDs have had and do have a huge impact on our children. And studies, uh, possibly as many as a thousand studies dating back to 1971, clearly show us that mass media influences actually desensitize our children to the act of violence and in fact even killing and that is what our amendment, Mr. Stupak of Michigan and myself uh, 
offer to the Rules Committee tonight to be considered in order. It's important to note that musicians and artists have constitutional rights to express themselves freely and openly. However, as elected leaders and parents and law-abiding citizens, I think it's our right and responsibility to attempt to protect our children from violent and destructive influences. My goal is to empower responsible parents to make informed decisions about the products that their children listen to and watch at home. Presently, CDs, video games, and television programs do not have a standardized labeling system that will inform parents about the content of the product. Some manufacturers and retailers are beginning to act responsibly by including voluntary labels that provide a small amount of information about the violent nature of the content being purchased. However, this system is neither mandatory nor standardized across all different mediums and industry sectors. We've all heard about video games such as Doom and Carmageddon that display violent and gruesome acts of killing. In fact, I understand that games such as this condition one of the shooters in Jonesboro, Arkansas to fire 27 shots from a range of over 100 yards with his friend to hit 15 people. That is remarkable even for an experienced law enforcement officer. Representative Stupak and I are introducing the 21st Century Media Responsibility Act. It's the same bill that Senators McCain and Lieberman are, uh, will be offering this week in the Senate. This bill, which we would like to introduce as an, as an amendment to H.R. 1501, would create a consistent and comprehensive system for labeling violent content in an audio and visual media products, including the labeling advertisements. The system will consist of a single label that will inform consumers of the nature, context, intensity of violent content, and age appropriateness of such products. The label will specify a minimum age in years for the purchase, viewing, listening to, use or consumption of the product or service. The label will also include an icon or symbol with written text in plain view of the consumer. In the case of video or motion picture programs, the label would appear at the beginning of the program and last for at least five seconds. The act bans the domestic sale or commercial distribution of unlabeled products after one year. Further, retailers are required to enforce the age restriction on such products subject to a fine of up to $10,000 for failure to do so. Manufacturers and producers who violate the labeling system are subject to fines of up to $10,000 a day for every day the product is in the marketplace. We believe this legislation is needed to give parents the information they need, responsible parents, I would add, to protect their children from various corrupting influences. These video games and programs teach children how to inflict pain and harm without experiencing the consequences of their actions. The difference between reality and fiction is lost with the flick of the power switch. The way this would work is six months from the date of enactment, the industry would have a window to work out this system itself. And if the system is not in place six months after date of enactment, the Federal Trade Commission would actually, and, and they would have to approve what the agreement is within six months. So we're not trying to uh, uh, force them to do something that many of them are already doing. We're just trying to put some order to the process that is already underway, really. And the Federal Trade Commission would work with the industry to accept a, a comprehensive labeling approach. But if it's not done within six months, the FTC would then step in, and they would have six months uh, to adopt a uniform labeling system for violent products such as this so that the goal would be one year from date of enactment you would have a uniform labeling system for violent mass media products much the same way that we all hope for a uniform labeling system for food products and safety in other areas. In short, this amendment will expand the Cigarette Labeling Act to include labeling for graphic violence which unquestionably is one of the primary factors that uh, we all seek to address and redress when the country is faced with this terrible dilemma of what would cause a child to actually hurt another child. Many people, Mr. Chairman, have written on this issue. Uh, I would point to Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, a book that he has written called On Killing, specifically speaking of the discipline within psychology now called killology and point to the fact that in World War II our national security forces had a dilemma that only about 15 to 20 percent of our soldiers would actually pull the trigger when faced with an enemy because even rattlesnakes don't kill other rattlesnakes. Species across God's creation don't kill their own kind. They kill others but they don't kill a member of their own species. 
Human beings are no exception there. It comes very unnatural. Our national security sought by taking the bullseye off the firing range and putting a human figurine to desensitize soldiers. By the time we got to the Korean War, the number was increased to 40%. By the time we got to Vietnam, technology set in. We had ways to desensitize our soldiers and the killing rate got up to 90%. But estimates are that our children now by age six are exposed to the same kinds and the same volume of desensitization therapy on this act of killing through video games and violence in the mass media that they actually are exposed to as much as those soldiers in Vietnam at a very early age and they're not able to differentiate fiction from reality. What we seek, Mr. Chairman, is a label much like this. It's much like a label on a pack of cigarettes that any responsible parent or consumer would notice immediately. And this right here, a movie, Natural Born Killers, the warning label says this product contains graphic and intense depictions of violence in the context of criminal activity. This product is inappropriate for consumption by minors under 17 years of age. In closing, I don't think we can legislatively fix this terrible problem. But I think there are some things we can do that are positive steps without violating people's rights to the First Amendment or Second Amendment. And I think really this burden calls on the Congress to act in any way we can. We already have the cigarette labeling. We already have food products labeling. Isn't this issue of graphic violence in the media having such a terrible impact on our small children, doesn't this deserve also a, a uniform labeling law? so that uh, any informed person would know whether to take that product home or allow their children to be exposed to it. And I thank very much the Rules Committee for considering this amendment. I've certainly explained it very, very clearly, very well, and very forcefully. And uh, I presume this, Mr. Stupak is uh, involved with this with you, according to my list. Is that correct? Mr. Stupak is my co-sponsor, and I think he is one of the people who was delayed for a long period of time because of bad weather flying I in understand. tonight. Thank you, Zach, very much. Any questions, Mr. diaz -Bellard? No questions, Mr. Chairman, but I would move uh, to include into the record at this time statements uh, by Mr. Quinn, uh, by Mr. Shattuck, and by Mr. Latham. Without objection. Uh, Louise? No question. Dr. Sue? No question. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I've been advised that uh, Mrs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been advised that uh, we would recognize Ms. Slaughter to discuss her amendment. Yes, of course it's all right. You don't even have to go down to the witness table if you're more comfortable where you are. Please do. And, uh, and I really will be as brief as anybody you ever heard in your life. I, uh, I have felt for a long time that it really is a tragedy in the United States that every day we have school buildings that sit empty and idle after the school day is over. These are buildings that have already been paid for by the taxpayers and there's such a crying need for us to be using them for after-school programs. A few years back, I had a children's summit in my district. I'd spent so, a lot of my time worrying about the preschool child and daycare. And it was the first time that I had ever experienced hearing children from 11 up talk about how much they did not want to be home alone, how they really needed some adult supervision, and how much they would like to stay in school. Uh, in the afternoon to make sure that, uh, that they had companionship and adult supervision. Um, it, I have this notion that if we could keep children after school until one of the parents is through with work who could then pick them up, that we would solve an awful lot of problems. First, that child would be able to get his or her homework, could use all the facilities at the school, the gym, music, everything else that we need there, uh, and that uh, I nurture the notion that when the parent comes by, then the child goes home with the parent and they sit down and have dinner and actually have conversation and talk to each other instead of fighting over the homework and other things that need to be done. Uh, I've wanted to do this ever since I've been, since I arrived in Washington 12 years ago. And one of the first pieces of legislation that I had, <coughs> excuse me, was to allow retired teachers to come back and tutor in after school programs without jeopardizing their Social Security. I know that from the Carnegie Foundation that most kids who drop out, drop out because they say that nobody cared. There are so many problems that we could solve by using the schools. We could cut down on the dropout program. We could cut down on the crime rate. We could do something about those children who live in the shadows and even while they're in school all day, never feel a part of it and never really understand where they belong. 
it's terribly important, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we use these schools to solve a lot of the problems that are crying out for solutions. And in order to pay for it, I would like to direct the, criminal, the juvenile justice funds to be split in half. It seems to me that it is as important or even more important that we use half those funds to prevent juvenile crime as it is to pay to incarcerate and to try to do something about the crime after it has occurred. This is a bill that has been supported by the American School Counselors Association, the Center for Women's Policy Studies, the Child Welfare League of America, Fight Crime, Invest in Kids, the National Federation of State High School Associations, the Police Athletic League, the Salvation Army, and the YWCA. It would be a tragedy of major proportions if we ignore one of the solutions that we drive by every day, and that is better use of the public school system to deal with the problems of our children who feel neglected, left out, or just need a little bit extra help to get along and not get behind. So succinctly put, Mr. Chairman, that is my amendment, and I ask consideration of the Rules Committee to make it in order. Well, Thank Mrs. Uh, Slaughter, I think uh, as is Typical of you, uh, uh, you were uh, uh, succinct and uh, uh, brilliant in your presentation. And, Thank you. Uh, and uh, Thank you. I am certain that the uh, the committee will, uh, with much seriousness, uh, consider uh, the amendment. I appreciate uh, that. At this point, um, uh, we will proceed to Mr. Schaefer. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and committee. I've been monitoring the proceedings here today uh, and uh, had a chance to sit in the room for the last uh, few minutes uh, watching as well. And I know that this committee has been presented with many, many opportunities for amendments that suggest new programs and new ideas and new approaches of all sorts of uh, innovative uh, frameworks to and uh, try to arrive at some reasonable solution and thoughtful process to curb youth violence and to deal with that which already exists. In fact, well, it, and what my amendment that I ask uh, the committee to make in order deals with uh, uh, really a few years down the line here, trying to calculate the full impact and the magnitude of, of the programs that we pass, whether they actually work. Right now, the federal government funds about 117 different programs in 15 different agencies or departments at a cost to taxpayers of about $4.4 billion annually. When the uh, youth violence uh, the juvenile justice bill that uh, was considered by the was considered by the education committee, the head of of, uh, uh, of the department, uh, Che Bilchek was his name, raised this report, which was the which he described as the most comprehensive report that the federal government has done with respect to youth violence prevention programs. The report is a scathing report, but it's the only one that we have, and I've provided copies of it to all of the members. Uh, the report is scathing to the point, and I just want, I just want to mention a couple of the items uh, that you'll, you'll find in the report. It says, uh, it, it says that we've not done a good job analyzing and evaluating youth violence programs and prevention programs over the 25 years that the federal government has proposed such things. He says there is little, uh, the report says there are little, um, little support for evaluation. And he says, unfortunately, uh, this view and policy is very short-sighted. When rigorous evaluations have been conducted, they often reveal that such programs are ineffective and can even make matters worse. It says no respectable business or corporation would invest millions of dollars in an enterprise without checking to see if it is profitable. Our failure to provide this type of evidence has seriously undermined the public confidence of prevention efforts generally, generally and is at least partly responsi uh, responsible for the current public support uh, for uh, building more prisons and incapacitating youth and, and so on. Of the thousands of programs that the federal government pays for, the uh, uh, the uh, Center for Study of Prevention and Violence that compiled, compiled this uh, review uh, analyzed about 400 of them. Of the 400 they analyzed, they selected 10 that they believed to be effective. Now, 
It would be easy to suggest that these programs are worthless and, uh, and, and don't accomplish their intended goal, but we all know that we've seen programs as individual members of Congress that have earned our confidence, and so my intent is not to uh, so much uh, point fingers or try to resolve all these issues in, at, at the current time in today's bill. But what I've proposed is a review by the General Accounting Office over a four-year period that asks a number of specific questions about the dollars that we spend previously and that the dollars that we're envisioning spending in the bills before us and to come back to Congress in four years and report on, on, uh, on that review. And the bill does, a, the amendment does one more thing and that is gives real leverage to that future Congress at that point in time to ask the fundamental question, if we were to start all over again today, would we create a system as it is now? If the answer is no, many of these programs will, would, would sunset. And so what this, uh, what, what, by turning the tables in such a way, it gives the government the incentive and the Congress the obligation to prove that these programs work before they are continued on. Uh, there are approximately 21 similar mechanisms in 21 different states around the country that have proven successful in evaluating regulatory programs and, uh, and uh, programs of, the, of this sort. And I am here to suggest that the, that the committee make an order, my amendment, to allow the federal government to analyze this, uh, these 117 different programs across the whole uh, 15 different federal agencies, the whole federal spectrum, in a similar sort of way. Uh, that's uh, the amendment, Mr. Chairman, and I ask that the committee make it in order. That's very clear. You've explained it very well and uh, makes a lot of sense. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Hastings. Uh, uh, I really commend you, uh, Bob, on, on this uh, approach because uh, it seems like so often when we have something that happened, obviously, in, in your state or any other states, uh, our first tendency is to act in any way that we possibly can. And after we act, and sometimes it's something that we don't know what, uh, maybe haven't looked at it closely enough, uh, we never revisit that. And I think if I understand what you're, what you're, uh, what you're getting to is you're trying to at least put a mechanism in this particular case, juvenile justice, where we have a mechanism to revisit what, in fact, we have done. Uh, and for that, I, I commend you. I think this is a very unique way to go because, and, and I say it from this perspective also, uh, not maybe that you may agree with me or not, but juvenile justice uh, is principally the responsibility of the states and not of the federal government. But yet we get involved in these things uh, in, in many ways, but we don't find out how good we have been in that involvement. And if your intent is to try to, to measure that in a timely manner, I congratulate you on, on your amendment. Well, if there was ever an opportunity to, I, I'm one who frankly believes we ought to ha apply this type of approach across the spectrum in all regulatory agencies. But uh, when the department came and, and offered to the committee this report, I thought to myself, this is a place we ought to start. There couldn't be any uh, clearer evidence that we've tried to help so many different ways without any real coordination that we have. Um, that we're spending, well, $4.4 billion and we have no measurable results in the United States of America. This is an effort to try to accomplish that and it takes, uh, it takes a number of years to do that. It's a big project, but I think it's one we ought to start now. Schaefer, did you say, did you provide us all with a copy of that report? You do. I provided a copy of the summary. It's the, the, there are 10 different programs that, uh, that, that each of these, this is, this is a report for one program, but the summary one covers program. all 10 of them, and, and the summary is what I've copied and Great. given to all members. Appreciate it very much uh, your presence and your participation and uh, your bringing forth the amendment. At this time, uh, we, will, we have the pleasure of uh, uh, hearing from uh, Mrs. De Lauro. Welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for the pronunciation. It uh, doesn't occur very often, and it's, and it's accurate. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to say thank you to the chairman, and thank you to the committee. It's a, uh, it's a long day, and I'm appreciative of uh, the hours that, uh, that you take to listen to uh, all of us. Uh, I'm happy to appear before the committee and, and also to, um, uh, to co-sponsor this amendment to protect children from gun violence, along with my colleagues uh, uh, Ben Cardin, Julia Carson, Juanita Melender McDonald, and Sheila Jackson Lee. 
I ask that the amendment be made in order when the House considers the juvenile justice legislation later this week. The amendment is very straightforward. Licensed gun dealers would be required to provide gun locks when they sell handguns. If they fail to do so, the Secretary of the Treasury could impose penalties of up to $2,500 and revoke their licenses. It is exactly the same uh, as the coal language uh, that the Senate passed uh, several weeks ago, and that passed by 78 to 20. Uh, that was the vote on its juvenile justice bill. Uh, we seek to offer the amendment because the view is that, that there is an opportunity, if there ever was, and if there ever was one, and, and truly a responsibility uh, to try to take some immediate, modest, uh, common sense steps to try to protect children uh, from gun violence. Um, the rash of school shootings over the last two years has highlighted the danger of guns in the hands of children. Uh, those school shootings uh, that have captured the most attention, uh, uh, but, but in fact, I think that there's a very strong statistic that we need to grasp, uh, and we should not obscure the fact that 13 children um, die every single day because of guns. Many of these deaths are accidental and involve very young children who inadvertently, inadvertently kill themselves or others. The stories are heartbreaking, it's a tragedy for, for families, and the fact is that the deaths do not have to happen. Child safety locks can stem the tragic tide of children's deaths due to guns. In 1991, there was a GAO report that found that one-third of accidental shooting deaths could be prevented by a safety device such as a trigger lock. The law enforcement community believes that gun locks work. A University of Washington survey of 102 of the largest police departments in the United States found that trigger locking devices were the number one safety method suggested. The gun industry itself, and I represent the gun industry in the state of Connecticut with Colt and Marlin, Winchester repeating arms, Mossberg, are engaged in the technology around this issue of, of safety devices for our children. Let me emphasize in the, in the strongest possible way that I can that this is not an attempt to go after anyone's gun or ability to own a gun or to impose an onerous burden on gun dealers uh, in this country. The National Shooting Sports Foundation says that it could support the mandatory inclusion of locking devices with all firearms as part of an overall safety program. The public supports child safety locks, as do the International Brotherhood of Police Officers, the National Education Association, the National Safe Kids Campaign, which is chaired by former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop. The amendment is simply an attempt to protect our children from the tragic gun violence that has claimed young lives, instilled fear in schools across the country, instilled fears in children in attending school and in parents of sending their children to school. We, we know in this institution that the causes of youth violence clearly are complicated and in fact call for very broad-based solutions, a lot of which have been discussed in this body today. In my, my view, there are kind of four areas. We need to engage more parents, and parents need to be involved in what's going, in, going on in the lives of the children. And I dare to say that we cannot legislate parental involvement in this, in this institution. Uh, in, in terms of our schools and the opportunity for there to be a smaller class sizes and more standards and accountability and that the inclusion of a larger number of guidance counselors and mental uh, health uh, 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 services so that our youngsters are getting the benefits of these uh, uh, efforts. Our, our, our colleagues have talked about an entertainment industry that is awash with violence, and that industry needs to take on a greater responsibility for what they are putting forward uh, in terms of the television or radio, et cetera, for our youngsters. And then finally, there is the issue of gun safety legislation. That is one of the pieces of this complicated um, 
uh, a puzzle, as I say, which call for broad-based solutions. But in fact, there isn't a reason to delay on something that is clear. Keeping guns out of the hands of our children will ensure that feelings of anger and hostility do not lead to fatal shooting sprees. Uh, I know that there have been a lot of gun safety amendments offered. I believe it's particularly important that the House have the opportunity to vote on gun lock language that has already been considered and passed by the Senate. It's a limited measure, but I believe a good one that could be quickly approved to protect children from gun violence. There has been some discussion about the safety hammer uh, product. I know that Chairman Hyde attempted to address the eligibility of the safety hammer product as a gun locking device. He's written me a letter um, in this regard. Uh, I remain concerned that the language in the McCollum Hyde Amendment is overly broad and could render the gun lock requirement meaningless by creating a new loophole. But I fully support Chairman Hyde in his attempt to include the safety hammer, uh, uh, but want to do it so in a way that works. I understand that Representative Sue Kelly is seeking to offer a narrowly tailored amendment to clarify uh, that safety hammer would be eligible and I would be happy to support such an effort. Both Representative Kelly's amendment and the amendment my colleagues and I have offered would ensure that we do not create a gun lock loophole. We should require child safety locks for handguns while allowing a full range of technologies to be used without opening new loopholes. I am hopeful, quite frankly, that we can find uh, the, 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 the language to close the loophole um, as is uh, 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 currently out there, uh, and that, in, that we can come together on this issue on both sides of the aisle to deal with this question and cooperate so that we can try uh, to move forward. And there are a number of ways in which uh, to accomplish this. I respectfully request that you make our amendment in order when the House considers the juvenile justice legislation this week. I thank you and would be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much thank for your you. testimony and for bringing the amendment forward. Uh, it certainly will be considered with uh, much seriousness. Uh, Mr. Hastings. Thank you, Mr. DeLauro. Thank you, thank you very much. much. Uh, at this time, um, it's our privilege to uh, receive Mr. DeMint, South Carolina. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Rules Committee. I know you've been at this a long time and you have miles to go before you sleep, so I'll be sure to be brief. So hopefully we'll get a little cooperation. <laughs> Uh, I'm here today to request that I be allowed to offer an amendment to the school safety and juvenile justice bill as it comes before the full house this week and to ask that all points of order against the amendment be waived. The purpose of my amendment is to ensure that a student's First Amendment right to freedom of religious expression is protected. This amendment is important to school safety because how we believe as children and adults is directly related to what we value and what we believe. I will, re I will correct that. I will say that how we behave as children and adults is directly related to what we believe. It is therefore essential that students not be discouraged from participating in positive faith-based forms of expression in schools. As many of you know, schools are now being intimidated into suppressing students' religious expression, which is constitutionally protected and by the threat of litigation. This litigation often arises from a confusion between a school allowing religious expression by a student, which is protected, and a school sanctioning and endorsing religion, which violates the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. Whether or not a school is in violation of the Establishment Clause is the job of the courts to decide, and that's not why I'm here. Unfortunately, many of these cases are being decided not on the merits, but by the threat of costly litigation. And because such cases are exempt from the common legal practice of each side paying its own attorney's cost, schools which are accused face the additional threat that if they lose, they must also pay the other side's legal fees. This is not a level playing field and it's not fair. 
For even if a school wins, it cannot recoup any of its costs from the other side. With quality teachers to retain and books to purchase and students to educate, many principals and local school boards choose to silence student religious expression and free speech to avoid the risk of costly litigation. And it is the students and their constitutional rights that suffer. Congress created the loser pays exception to the normal practice for schools in order to encourage the defense of civil liberties. Unfortunately, it is now being used as a weapon to suppress these very liberties. My amendments simply return such cases to the normal practice of each side paying its own fees. Such cases should be decided on the merits and on a level playing field, not by threats and bullying. I ask that my amendment be ruled in order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ben. Thank you, Mr. Ben. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hastings. Any questions? No questions. Thank you very much for uh, your patience. Mr. Stupak from um, Michigan, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as you know, I have uh, five different amendments there. And um, I hope as the Rules Committee considers all the amendments before tonight that you take a holistic approach of everything that's going on. Uh, having served as a chair for the Democrat Task Force for the last three years, you talk about school violence, it's not just guns. It's not just what's happening in the home, but we've got to look at what's happening in communities and the schools themselves. And that's why my amendments, uh, there's enough people focusing on guns, has focused on other aspects of school violence. If I may, I'll try to just summarize them. Uh, I would start with the hotlines amendment, as I call it, uh, the same as Mr. Weiss. I believe Mr. Weiss testified earlier today about it. The amendment would allow states to create and operate confidential, toll-free telephone hotlines that operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in order to provide students, parents, school officials, and others the opportunity to re report sign specific threats of imminent school violence to appropriate state and local law enforcement entities and school officials. Mr. Chairman, throughout all the hearings we've held, we find that the students tell us they're afraid, number one, of be calling, being, being a snitch, if you will, and they're also afraid that if you call and say someone's bringing a weapon to school, that weapon will be turned against you once they realize it. So the need for confidentiality is very great. Uh, we know from all the studies and work we've done that about 100,000 weapons go to school each day. And so the fears are real. If you ask the kids, they know who's carrying them, who's bringing them. Uh, let's put in the hotlines of the ask that you make that amendment in order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe uh, Patsy Mink has also testified for the 100,000 school counselors, as we call it, or 100,000 ju juvenile service providers uh, to help our schools to address the mental, emotional, and developmental needs of secondary schools uh, students. There are about 7.5 million students under the age of 18 that require mental health services, and yet we find that one in five actually receive it. We know that... Um, Probably about one in 20 preteens and adolescents suffer from clinical depression. We know that 57% of the teens who attempt suicide uh, suffer from major depression. And we know of the suicides that take place in, in this country with uh, talking with their parents, probably only 13% of them ever suspect that their child would commit suicide. Uh, we know all the statistics. What we're lacking is assistance. So we would hope that um, we could put this amendment in order. This will be an amendment, uh, school counselors amendment or juvenile service providers. We would hope that you would look favorably upon that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my third one, uh, Representative Zach Womp and I have been working with the media product violence labeling amendment. Uh, that is to put some standardized labeling on videos, um, movies, television, um, um, videos, music, uh, games, the games. Uh, we have so much violence in, in this um, nation and um, we are asking, we're asking that um, we put labeling on there. This amendment, Mr. Chairman, in all fairness, has been developed with the help of Senator Lieberman and Se Senator McCain. And all we're asking is a standardized product violence labeling system for interactive video games, video programs, motion pictures, and music. Uh, it bans the domestic sale or commercial distribution of unlabeled products after a year. 
uh, we allow the industry, we allow the industry to actually provide the label. And if you look at it, Mr. Chairman, when you pick up any food product in this country, you f provide, we provide nutritional labels on all food products, so you, the consumer, knows what is in the food product. Why shouldn't consumers of videos, games, television, and music know what is in the products before they buy them? This would simple say, simply say that the labels would be black and white labels, that they would clearly inform the consumer about the violent content of every product. Um, I'm sure that will be somewhat uh, controversial, but I think it's only fair to inform you, me, parents, even the consumers, um, inform them the nature, the context, the intensity of the violent content, and the appropriate age of such products. Uh, last but not least, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Date Rape uh, Prevention Act. Um, I've been working on this one for two years. I've been working closely lately with uh, Mr. Fred Upton from Michigan. And the amendment really requires a drug enforcement agency to schedule both GHB and ketamine as Schedule Three controlled substances. As you know, Mr. Chairman, date rape has been sort of the uh, wave of uh, parties nowadays where they slip GHB or ketamine into a drink. It's tasteless, it's colorless, it's odorless, and basically the person uh, blacks out, and um, usually uh, sexual advantage is taken advantage of that individual, and when they come to the next day, they have no idea that number one, a drug was inappropriately placed in their drink, uh, but they know they were raped and uh, can't really remember much about it. And if you put too much GHB in, in, into a drink or a ketamine, as was the case in Michigan, you can die from it because you go into a coma and you, just, and you die. We've had it recently in Michigan. This is um, GHB causes people to forget or black out for extended periods of time. It's a dangerous drug. Uh, really law enforcement, uh, medical, EMT personnel really don't know a lot about it. In fact, in our amendment, we ask that there be an educational aspect placed in it. Uh, the drug at one time was used for to help uh, in, in 1990, it was banned. They used it for a while in Europe. Uh, the FDA did ban it in 1990. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have a right schedule for it so it continued to be uh, used appropriately. And um, But the date rape and the way it's being used right now, the formulas on the Internet and everything else, uh, we have to do something with it. It's called the date rape drug. Uh, last but not least, like the Senate, um, I'd like to see the James Gelf Body Armor Act of 1999. Basically, what it says, says it prohibits the purchase or possession of body armor by violent felons. Uh, we don't let violent felons possess firearms. Why do we allow them to uh, possess body armor? Uh, as you've seen recently in uh, armed robberies throughout the United States, they're dressed in body armor and police officers can't bring them down or stop them or anything. They're virtually uh, resistant to all types of bullets. Uh, James Gelf was a San Francisco police officer. He was actually from my district. He was killed in 1994 trying to stop a bank robber. Uh, since about 1995, I've been working on this. We put it in a couple other bills only to have it die in the Senate. This is the first time the Senate has actually taken up the James Gelf body armor. Uh, my total bill goes after mail order uh, sales of body armor. I do not have that in this, my, this amendment. I've kept it strictly the same as the Senate have it. So it would be in... Uh, um, compliance with what the Senate has passed and, and therefore hopefully we can at least uh, increase penalties and prevent violent felons from obtaining body armor. With that, Mr. Chairman, those are the five uh, amendments I have. I hope you would look favorably upon them and, and make them all in order. And if you have any questions, I'm pleased to try to answer them on any one of the five. I want to thank you, Mr. Stupak. Uh, you've addressed a number of very serious issues in the amount of, uh, of your work in addition to its seriousness is uh, reflected uh, in your amendments. Any questions of Mr. Stubeck, Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Hastings? Mr. Myrick? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fletcher. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present this to yourself and the distinguished members of this committee. As you know, this week the House will be beginning the consideration of House Resolution 1501, the Consequences for Juvenile Offenders Act, which is a very important step toward addressing the growing problem of juvenile crime in this country. While we can and should strengthen laws holding youth more accountable, 
uh, for the behavior, I believe that we can be most effective also by encouraging local communities to contribute to the molding of a child's character by teaching virtue over vice. Our schools cannot and should not hold the sole responsibility for shaping a child's character, but they can play a very important role. The qualities that are instilled in our youth today will give them the hope for their future. That is why I will be offering an amendment to House Resolution 1501 that will allow state and local education agencies to form partnerships designed to implement character education programs that reflect the values of teachers, parents, and local communities, and incorporate elements of good character, including honesty, citizenship, courage, justice, respect, personal responsibility, and trustworthiness, values that I believe we can all agree on. This amendment is not a federal mandate, nor does it create a national character education curriculum. It gives local communities the freedom to develop and implement a program consistent with local values. I believe that my language will complement the Senate language, and it is an improvement because it ensures that parents and local communities are given a voice in deciding what a school's character education curriculum should include, not just the state and local education agencies. It provides more local flexibility. In addition, I'd like to request that my amendment be considered as a perfecting amendment to the amendment offered by Education and Workforce Chairman, Mr. Goodling. I have worked with him on this matter, and he supports the inclusion of this program as a friendly amendment and as an allowable activity in the block grant portion of his amendment. These values should be a standard part of any history or civics curriculum, and I believe we owe it to our children to make sure their parents and teachers have the resources necessary to return this common sense approach to education back to our schools. I've worked in the state legislature on character education, and we've implemented a curriculum in Kentucky. Uh, this amendment is very important to me and my constituents, and I believe to those all across our nation. Uh, it's an investment in the future of our children and grandchildren. I hope you will find this amendment uh, in order for the rules on House Resolution 1501. Mr. Chairman and members of this distinguished committee, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fletcher. We appreciate uh, your being here and for your very thoughtful remarks. Mr. diaz Ballard, no Mr. Frost, no Mr. Hastings, Mrs. Myrick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, and now I understand that uh, our friend from Dallas would like to uh, comment on his amendment. We're happy to recognize Mr. Frost. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will make my comments from here rather than going down to the table, if that's all right. You're welcome to make them wherever you'd like, Marty. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, more than a year ago, uh, my colleagues Robert Menendez of New Jersey and Dave Bonier of Michigan and I introduced legislation that we hoped would help school districts across the country deal with the tide of rising violence in schools. Sadly, as recent events show, the need for this kind of assistance is only growing. In the 106th Congress, we have reintroduced this legislation, but with some changes that reflect the pressing needs occasioned by this national crisis. Our bill, H.R. 1895, the School Anti-Violence Empowerment Act, SAVE, would help schools hire more counselors, increase funding for school-based law enforcement, provide for after-school programs, and would empower the Department of Education working with the Department of Justice and school districts across the country to develop a model violence prevention program. We are requesting that these provisions, which have been filed with the committee as four <coughs> amendments, be made in order so that these important initiatives can be part of this important debate. And, and I will summarize, but uh, the First Amendment would help school districts hire more counselors through a grant program. Our amendment would authorize $700 million for each of the fiscal years 2000 through 2004 and it will allow 50% of those funds to be used to hire counselors and the other half to be used to enhance school safety programs for students, staff, and school facilities. Secondly, we are offering an amendment that would provide for 10,000 new uniformed school safety officers. In addition to those officers, our amendment would provide for another 10,000 police officers to be hired by local communities through the Community-Oriented Policing Services, COPS program. 
Our amendment would authorize a total of $1.5 billion over five years, with 75% of the funds for these new officers coming from the federal share and 25% from local government. Having uniformed officers in our schools has proven to be an effective way to instill trust in the safety and security of a school, and an officer's presence may in fact head off dangerous situations. This is a critical issue, and the House should have the opportunity to debate it. Our third amendment would fund local after-school programs that will provide a safe haven for children in the hours when most juvenile crime takes place, between 3 and 6 p.m. There is a huge demand for these kinds of programs. Nationwide, more than 2,000 applications for federal support have been submitted, but to date there has only been enough money to fund 300 of these requests. That means that demand outstrips supply by more than six to one. We need to do better, and this amendment, which authorizes $1 billion over five years, would give us that chance. Lastly, we are requesting that an amendment which would direct the Departments of Education and Justice to develop a model violence prevention program for the use of school districts around the country be made in order. This amendment would also provide for the creation of a clearinghouse within the Education Department which would provide school districts with information on what has worked for other school districts so that schools don't have to recreate the wheel, but will allow them to tailor programs that will best suit the local community. This is an important part of any program designed to prevent violence, and the House should have the opportunity to debate it. Now, Mr. Chairman, just by way of general comment, um, a lot of the debate and a lot of the discussion today has dealt with various gun provisions. Uh, obviously, that is, uh, those represent only a portion of the solution for the school violence problem. And the program, the, the four parts of this uh, program that Congressman Menendez and Congressman Bonnier and I uh, have introduced and outlined, I believe goes to some of the fundamental ways of dealing with the problems in our schools. Now, some of these provisions, are, in, but not all, are incorporated in the Democratic Substitute. Uh, assuming that the committee makes the Democratic substitute in order, there is also, we, we, we understand, there is the possibility that the Democratic substitute may not prevail on the floor. And we certainly would like the opportunity to offer these major school violence prevention programs as separate amendments, particularly if the Democratic substitute should not succeed. And they would be, obviously, our amendments would be authored, would be offered, uh, to the base bill 1501 uh, would not be offered to the, uh, the separate piece of legislation dealing with gun violence. And it is very important <coughs> that this Congress uh, approach the, school of, the problem of school violence from a multitude of directions and that we have uh, a variety of programs that can be helpful and that can be helpful immediately in dealing with this problem in our Well, country. thank you very much, Mr. Frost. And let me just say that you have uh, argued very vigorously in support of what it is that we're trying to do with this rule, making uh, both measures uh, in order uh, so that we can, in fact, have a, uh, uh, a wide range of choices uh, for members in dealing with uh, what obviously is a very troubling problem. So we appreciate your coming forward with that. Any of our colleagues have any questions of Mr. Frost? Thank you very much. Our next witness is the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Green. And uh, Mark, we're pleased to have you uh, join us. And it uh, looks as if you have some guests with you uh, here. I uh, have uh, just uh, just one observer from a foreign uh -huh. land is uh, wonderful. Well, is watching this unusual process that we're going through. It is uh, an interesting and uh, somewhat unusual uh, process that we've got going. And I. Uh, will say that if you have prepared remarks, they will appear in their entirety in the record, and we would uh, welcome a summary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much for the opportunity uh, to testify and uh, for the consideration of this amendment. Uh, I'm here tonight to ask for your consideration of my amendment, which requires mandatory life sentences for sex offenders who repeatedly prey on children. In today's society, we obviously hear too many stories about children being hurt or killed. We're all familiar with the rash of shootings that have taken place in our nation's schools, which is, of course, one of the reasons why we're considering this bill this evening. However, while we're considering children's safety, I don't believe we can overlook the very serious but not often talked about problem of sex offenses against children. In my state of Wisconsin, over three-quarters of all sexual assault victims in 1996 were juveniles. 
and sex offenders are nine times more likely to repeat their crimes than other classes of criminals. You may be shocked to learn of a recent Washington Post study which concluded that the average child molester will commit child molestation acts 300 times during his lifetime. These statistics are not only alarming, they are deeply disturbing to all of us. And I think we all recognize that every time one of these sexual predators reoffends, he is destroying a child's life. When we encounter someone who has repeatedly assaulted our children, we must remove them from society. We cannot wait around for yet another offense. This amendment is a modified version of my bill, H.R. 1989, the Two Strikes and You're Out Child Protection Act, which enjoys bipartisan support. The amendment would provide for life imprisonment upon a second conviction of a serious sex offense against a child. Under this amendment, state offenses, which would have been federal crimes had they been prosecuted as such, would qualify as one of the covered strikes. This amendment does not create any new federal crimes. It simply increases the penalty for the most serious sex offenses to mandatory life upon a second conviction. I appreciate your consideration and would ask that you will it in order. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much, uh, Mr. Green. We appreciate your stepping up to deal with what is obviously a very, very troubling issue, and I, I think you're to be commended for, for your work on this. Uh, Mr. Hastings? I uh, want to relate a, a uh, <coughs> experience I went through when I was in the legislature, and, and, and what you're trying to find here or do here may be a solution to that. I, I attended, uh, when I was in the legislature, I attended a forum. And the issue was, what do you do with people that are child offenders? How do you, how do you change their way uh, so that th that won't happen again? And there was a very, uh, the, the speaker at this particular uh, forum uh, had a very narrow discipline. That's all he dealt with was child offenders. And he came, uh, he concluded after a long presentation with a very chilling observation in that he said, I don't think that there's anything that we can do. Now, if he's right, of course, and we do nothing about that and there's repeated uh, offenses, then obviously there are more victims. And so I don't know if this is the answer, but I just wanted to relate to you and, and on the record that was a very chilling observation from somebody whose profession is, uh, is in that way. If you have any comments on that, I'd, I'd like to have them, Mark. Uh, well, thank you. My uh, understanding of this issue, and I, I did uh, in Wisconsin author a law, uh, two strikes in for child molesters. Our research showed that there is no known cure for pedophilia, and that as I had mentioned earlier, the recidivism rate is extraordinarily high. My view is if we find someone who has committed a second such offense, they are self-identified as either unwilling or unable to be rehabilitated, and we have no choice. Uh, since there is no known cure, we have no choice but to remove them from society. It is deeply disturbing and chilling, as you say. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. Well, Mr. Green, I'm glad you're here today because when I saw your dear colleague on this some time ago, I was puzzled by it because this provision already exists in federal law. I authored the Amber Hagerman Child Protection Act in 1996, which is this exact provision that was signed into law by President Clinton. And I don't know if your staff is aware of that. You might want to check that in the federal code. But this exact, I authored this exact provision in 1996, which was signed into law by the President. It's called the Amber Hagerman Child Protection Law. It's a two strikes and you're out, uh, life imprisonment. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the the way we invoked federal jurisdiction, it was someone who crossed state lines and committed the offense. Now, I don't know if you've defined it in the same way. We didn't say the child was taken across state lines. We said the perpetrator crossed state lines and committed the offense. But it also provides for uh, that one of those offenses could be a, uh, a state law offense. So you, I believe this provision is redundant of current law. And uh, I'm a strong supporter of this because, as I said, I authored the bill that sure. created this as a part of federal law already. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually familiar with, uh, with your law. We did work with your office in this. This covers uh, a number of offenses above and beyond the offenses that are covered by, by the uh, measure you authored, which I think is a great provision in law. We uh, seek simply to build upon that. And well, what, to does it it. what does it cover that was not covered by the provision? Um, I don't have the precise that. provisions of your measure here, but I can tell you the provisions that we cover. 
Uh, ours covers aggravated sexual abuse, uh, sexual abuse, sexual abuse of a minor, abuse of sexual contact, sexual abuse resulting in death, the buying or selling of children, and the transportation of minors under the age of 16 across state lines. And uh, our research was that this covers a number of offenses in addition to the ones that, uh, that you would cover. Of course, under the, the, the provision that I authored, we provided if, the, if death of the child occurs, we provided for the death penalty um, uh, in federal court. And um, uh, I assume that would be your intention also, that uh, if death of the child occurred, that, uh, that the death penalty would be a possibility. Oh, well, this, this, just, this would not good. change. My understanding is that, that um, the crime that we're referring to is not covered by yours, because if it is, obviously it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have needed to draft well, it in the way we did. Well, I would, uh, it'd be interesting. I would ask that you, I would, uh, would ask that your staff pursue this a little bit more. I don't know whether, it, what the attention of the committee is in terms of making this in order, uh, particularly if this is not made in order. Uh, I think we should uh, have a further discussion because I think most of the things that you indicated uh, were covered. I don't remember the exact uh, sure. uh, the exact offenses that were covered in the legislation from '96, but uh, uh, but it uh, it is a two strikes and you're out mm -hmm. uh, provision uh, providing for life in prison. Yeah, well, we we'd be glad to provide you with a side by side comparison. I think that would we, be helpful. We did look at that. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Green. You, Mr. We appreciate your being here. Our next witness is a gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Kennedy. And uh, we would welcome a <coughs> summary of uh, Absolutely. Your, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll submit my uh, full statement, statement for the record. It will appear without uh, objection. The this record. is the gun buyback grant amendment. Um, I have found that these gun buyback programs in my district have worked tremendously. We've had the local police departments pair up with uh, local businesses to offer $25 for unwanted guns in the home. We've, we've collected already 1,000 in my small state of Rhode Island in the first district. Um, it seems to me that if we modeled this program like the Bulletproof Vest Grant Act, we could help get more unwanted guns out of the home. And keep in mind, a gun in the home is 47 times more likely to be used in a suicide attempt to be used in an accidental shooting or, or something of this nature than it's ever likely to be used in, uh, against a perpetrator trying to break in. So a gun inherently makes the home unsafe. Many people, once they have guns, especially after Littleton, Colorado, and all these other uh, tragedies, want to get rid of their guns. We ought to make it easy for them to get rid of their guns. And that's why I think this would be a good amendment for this uh, committee to authorize. And. Um, uh, I would hope that you would make this uh, amendment number six in order. And, and also, let me just say, guns that are in the home, they're obviously, if they're unwanted, they're more likely to be stolen. And of course, you know that those guns end up in the black market as well. So there's a number of reasons the uh, International uh, Brotherhood of Police Officers supports this legislation, as well as numerous other law enforcement agencies. So I'd ask you to hopefully put this in the, uh, in the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Hastings? Mr. Frost, Mrs. Myron, thank you very much thank for being here. We'll certainly. Uh, okay, our next witness is a gentleman from uh, North Carolina, Mr. Hayes. Please come forward and uh, we welcome you to the Rules Committee and we ask you to provide a summary and any prepared remarks you have will appear in the record in their entirety. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members. Thank you very much. What I have is an amendment on values-based education in our school. My amendment authorizes the Department of Education to offer grants to local education agencies to enable schools to incorporate into their curriculum on a voluntary basis character and values-based classes, including but not limiting to the history of the law, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, tenets of faith, the Code of Hammurabi, and the Ten Commandments. Talk about character and values, it is important to look at the foundation of the law in our country. Our founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution based on their Christian values, truth in government, and tenets of faith. The spirit of Ed Flex that we have passed just this spring, we're allowing our local teachers, parents, and school board members to develop and implement a faith-based curriculum in their schools to complement the existing coursework. There's a huge outcry from parents, teachers, and students to return to the tenets of faith. The separation of church and state has become a great divide. 
To allow the option of flexibility plus funding for curricula teaching our historical connection to biblical principles is a significant step in the right direction. We can help empower communities to stay involved in their students' lives through directive teaching, help lead them in the right direction. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I would ask for the favorable consideration of the committee on my amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayes. We appreciate your being here. Mr. Hastings? Well, Mr. Hayes, would you refresh my recollection? Uh, the Code of Hammurabi, is, is that the one that has an eye for an eye in it and those kind of things? If you don't like that one, Ten Commandments will look great to you. No, I'm just asking you. That's is, right. Is that what's in the Code of Hammurabi? <laughs> it is, among other things. Uh -huh. I have a copy here if you would like well, to see it. That's very interesting. Uh, would this be taught as a, uh, as a historical document? Right. Uh, it's part of history of the law. Is it attempting to uh, suggest that this is an appropriate approach for uh, modern day times? Well, it would seem that a number of broad-based approaches to the teaching of the law, in particular, the Ten Commandments, would be a great improvement, particularly in today's well, no, atmosphere. I was asking about the Code of Hammurabi. Are you suggesting that's an appropriate way for us to conduct ourselves today? No, I don't think so. There are some very interesting parts in it, as you will see when you read it. But across the board, I don't think we want to adopt that. Why would you include that in your curriculum? I don't understand. It's a part of the history of law, where our law has evolved from. That was the original code of law, as I understand, when someone tried to codify the law. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. This is my record. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayes. We appreciate you. your being here. Our uh, next witness is my uh, California colleague, Ms. Uh, Melinda McDonald. We're happy to welcome you, uh, and uh, please feel free to provide us with a summary, and that entire prepared statement will appear in the record, and if you'd like to, to uh, briefly summarize. We Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I come today to offer two amendments. Um, one is the child safety lock. As you might recall, I introduced this amendment, child safety lock, in the 105th Congress because of the rash of violence that I had in my district of Watts and Compton. I reintroduced it in the 106th Congress with a bill, and now I'm presenting an amendment on this for the child safety lock because it is important that with the sobering experience that we had with Littleton, and of course, in my district, I've had this for years, that we provide a child safety lock so that our children will not uh, be prone to use guns uh, in a violent way. Um, this bill also has, in addition to the child safety lock, it has a provision for education whereby you use 2% of uh, funding from um, gun revenue to provide education and the proper storage of a firearm so that our children can, again, have some type of safe haven in terms of um, preventing them from using guns um, indiscriminately. The second uh, amendment that I have, and, and, and I mean, this does not violate in any way the Second Amendment. It simply helps us to um, make sure that there is a safe environment for our children, and certainly our children uh, should have that. The second um, amendment that I have is introducing the, um, this is another bill that I'm doing an amendment on, is the PAT Act. And that bill enjoys bipartisan support has over 20 uh, grassroots organizations. And this bill simply says that you should not um, provide or you should not deliver any liquor to a child uh, or that we should have an adult signature when delivering packages containing alcoholic beverages. Uh, this bill is exactly like the, the uh, language that's in the Senate side that uh, Senator Feinstein introduced last, uh, last week. Parents and leaders uh, need to do something to provide um, having our children have alcohol delivered to them via the internet or delivered to the home where they can use credit cards, uh, sign for liquor, and go on a, a binge. So these are two amendments that I do have. I will not read this. I just simply ask that you make them in order uh, so that we can provide the safety that are indeed uh, needed for our children. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate your very strong commitment to this. And uh, you're correct. Uh, we noted that you had first introduced the uh, trigger lock provision in the 105th Congress. And 
appreciate your desire to ensure that we don't see this uh, liquor getting into the hands of children, uh, too. So uh, Thank your you. effort here is to be commended. Uh, Mr. Hastings? Mr. Frost? Uh, do you know uh, how your amendment on trigger locks differs from some of the other amendments that have been introduced? For example, uh, Mr. Davis of Virginia has oh. one, and Ms. Kelly of New York has, has an amendment on that subject. Are you aware of any differences? I was not aware of the other amendments. I do know that um, Congresswoman Delora and um, Congresswoman Carson um, have the same language that I have in my safety lock bill. I have not looked at the other amendments, but I would think that they're all similar to the language that was introduced in the Senate bill, because I think we all kind of took from that. However, my bill that was introduced in the 105th Congress has the same language as we had um, in the Senate bill. Well, I raised that because when I raised, raised this issue earlier today uh, about what had happened to this amendment, it had been dropped out of uh, the base bill that mm -hmm. uh, Mr. McCollum had originally yes. introduced. And the chairman, uh, Mr. Dreyer, referred me to Mr. Davis's amendment. Now, I don't know. Is Mr. Davis's amendment substantially similar to Ms. M Melinda McDonald's amendment? I'm not amendment? sure. I just knew that that was one of the amendments that had been offered. Is this Davis of Illinois? No, no Davis no, of uh, Mr. Virginia. Davis of Virginia. Oh, okay. Virginia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom Davis. I'll read you the description that was given to us. It okay. says, establishes the mandatory transfer of a secure gun storage or safety device with the transfer of any handgun from a licensed manufacturer, importer, or dealer establishes criteria for the liability of a gun owner should his or her gun be used in an unlawful act. Um, it is the same language that I have, similar to that. Um, Mr. Chairman, assuming these amendments are substantially the same, uh, are we looking to a situation where there would be bipartisan authors uh, where both Democrats and Republicans, please present. Obviously, would be whenever, able to whenever, all whenever we have a chance to put together uh, some kind of bipartisan agreement on an issue, we uh, usually pursue that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a likelihood that we would have uh, Republicans, Democrats joining on in support of an amendment like that. Uh, the other question I have goes to your second amendment uh, dealing with the, the sale of alcoholic beverages over the internet. Yeah. Very interesting issue. Uh, do I recall, and did you say that this actually was incorporated in the Senate bill? Um, it was. It was. Um, and it's the prohibition of the shipment of alcohol to minors. This bill has bipartisan support. It's Senator Diane Watson, S-254. Yeah, but it did, was actually added on the Senate floor to the juvenile and justice to the ju bill. That's right, juvenile justice bill. And as far as you know, this is, this is not contained in the, in the base bills that have been introduced uh, uh, before this committee. This is not in the Juvenile Justice uh, no, Act no, it is as not. it came out it of the... It is one uh, that I um, introduced because it was a part of the Senate bill that she right, introduced, and so I am introducing it here. But for it us to consider it, it's not in any of the other legislation, no, 1501 or any of the no, other bills not. that are pending, so it is we not. would have to actually add this on the you floor by making your amendment in order. That is correct. I think it's a very good idea, and I hope that we will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Let me say that I'm impressed with your very strong tie to the state of California and the state legislature. You just referred to Diane Feinstein as Diane Watson, and uh, I think that did that I is, really? Yes, My goodness! And I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure that Senator Watson. I worked with her for years, that. and so I know you did. Senator you did. Uh, Diane Feinstein. I suspect I was the only one in the room who caught that. Uh, You're a Californian. That's yes, why. as a Californian. And I'm sorry for that, yes. Senator Chairman, Diane Feinstein. It's interesting how. Times have changed. This deals with sale of alcohol under the by the internet. Mm -hmm. A hundred years ago, uh, almost a hundred years ago, my grandfather was in the liquor business, and he sold alcohol by mail. Mm -hmm. uh, I've actually seen the handbills of uh, where you could order it by mail and have it mailed to your house. So mm -hmm. certainly, it is an interesting. Uh, twist and development of uh, something of technology changed, that now you can where, where you used to be able to order it by mail now you can order it through the internet senator mm -hmm. orrin hatch has a similar uh, bill that he too introduced and mm -hmm. it has passed right well thank you very much uh no questions from uh, mrs myrick i presume okay thank you very much thank you mr chairman we appreciate your uh, effort here and forward to seeing you uh on the house floor with this bill thank you thank you so much our next witness is uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Sweeney. And uh, nice to see you uh, for the second time today on a different piece of legislation. And we, 
Again, uh, as I said earlier, we'll welcome a summary and any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will give to the clerk my full statement. I, I am here today to offer two amendments on the Child Safety and Protection Act uh, and ask that they be made in order. My first amendment uh, incorporates H.R. 1647, Suzanne's Law, which was introduced earlier this year. Uh, after uh, two of my constituents, Mr. and Mrs. Douglas Lyle, lost their daughter, a student at Univ the University of Albany, uh, on March 2nd, 1998. It's a, it's a simple requirement. It says that essentially we would amend the Crime Control Act of 1990 to prohibit law enforcement agencies from imposing a waiting period before accepting a missing children uh, less than 21 years of age report. Uh, thereby extending this important protection to college-age students. Uh, current law requires the disappearance of children under the age of 18 be reported immediately to the appropriate federal authorities. I ask that that be extended now to uh, those of college age and ask that this committee uh, thoughtfully consider that. Secondly, like Mr. Frost, I, I think that the school violence issue requires a uh, multitude of directions and so my second amendment uh, that I introduced on January 6th uh, denies federal assistance to states which fail to take action against violent students. The amendment would require a local educational agency to expel from school for a period of not less than two months uh, a student who is convicted of crime, the crime of violence. The amendment does not prohibit a local education agency from, provi uh, from providing educational services to a violent student uh, in, a, in an alternative setting. I'm asking that if we are to take control of violence in the schools, we must insist that our schools take a hard line against those that commit acts of violence. And while this legislation falls under the purview of the Education and Workforce Committee, I feel this is an important message to send as part of the Juvenile Crime Bill and request that the committee provide the appropriate waivers so that it may be considered on the House floor. And I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sweeney. Appreciate uh, your being here, Mr. Hastings. Mr. Frost, Mrs. Myrick, wonderful job. Thank Thanks you so again. Much. Thanks for being here. Our next uh, witness is uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. And uh, again, would welcome uh, a brief summary, and your prepared text will uh, appear in the record. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I wish to offer an amendment to, to this bill that would assist states in compiling the records of violent juveniles and establishing statewide computer systems for the records. In addition, states would have the option of making these records available to the National Crime Information Center at the FBI where there would be access by law enforcement officials from other states. Currently, the FBI is equipped to accept and post records of violent juvenile offenders. Similar language for such a system of records already exists in the Senate passed Juvenile Justice Bill. The reason I offer this amendment is a tragic story from my district. A Cleveland police officer, Robert Clark, was killed in the line of duty in July 1998 while attempting to arrest a drug dealer. The individual who shot Officer Clark had accumulated a considerable uh, juvenile uh, criminal record between Ohio and Florida. Uh, at the time of his arrest, he had more than 50 prior arrests almost all of them as a juvenile. That was 50 prior arrests. Uh, now, had an automated record system been in place when this individual first appeared before a juvenile court in Ohio, law enforcement officials in Ohio would have had access to his extensive criminal record in Florida. As a result, uh, this individual most certainly would have received a stricter sentence, and the events which led to the tragic death of the police officer would have uh, been avoided. And uh, there were, but unfortunately, it was not a system of records. Uh, this officer was shot, and three children were left without a father. Uh, across the country, states are increasingly moving in the direction of information sharing and disclosure of juvenile records as they pertain to violent offenses. In fact, in many states, juvenile uh, records are already considered public record. Uh, uh, this am amendment uh, has the endorsement of uh, Gilbert Gallegos, who's the executive director of the Fraternal Order of Police. And I'm requesting a general waiver for the amendment, and I thank the committee for its time and uh, consideration. Uh, if I may, there, there are, are three quick points that I'd like to make, uh, finally, for this committee's consideration. First, there are no federal grant programs that would assist in the development of automated juvenile records uh, for violent offenders. Uh, second, uh, this amendment would not allow for the broad dissemination of juvenile records. 
And uh, uh, third, the uh, handling of juvenile, juvenile records would be governed by the same strict administrative discipline as for the handling of adult records. Thank you very much, Mr. Kucinich. We appreciate uh, your being here and for your commitment to this issue. Mr. Hastings, Mr. Frost, Mrs. Myrick. I just had one comment because we also, uh, a few years ago, had a member of our extended family who was a police officer who was shot point blank, murdered by a juvenile who um, had 19 felonies in another state, it turned out as well. So um, it's a very frustrating situation. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Ms. Myrick. The, uh, the thing that I would hope the Rules Committee keeps in mind is that even though in the 105th and 106th Congress, the uh, Commerce, Justice, and State Appropriations Bill contained language that directed states to consider, to consider juvenile, uh, reforming their juvenile record system, uh, nothing really happened as a result of that, but this amendment would provide clear and fair-minded language to provide states with a specific grant program. I really appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We appreciate your being here. Uh, next witness is a gentlewoman from New Mexico, uh, Ms. Wilson, and I don't see her here. And so, oh, here she is. I'm sorry, I didn't see you uh, in the back there. And we're, we welcome a summary from you, and uh, any prepared remarks you have will appear in the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here. I know it's been a long day, and I'll summarize uh, uh, Thank you. my remarks. There are three amendments I've asked for the Rules Committee consideration of, to, to uh, be ruled in order. The first has to do with the establishment of a National Center for Security Technology. Um, the uh, Sandia National Laboratories over the last uh, four or five years has been using its expertise in security technology to benefit schools. And they have done 120 school security assessments in nine different states. And they found a number of things. Of course, school administrators are not trained in security. Uh, they've also found that schools are vulnerable and there is no support infrastructure for school security. They started two, three years ago now with a pilot program in Berlin High School in Berlin, New Mexico, to apply some of the lessons learned from our national security programs to schools. They don't have a one-size-fits-all or a technology or a high-tech or high-cost focus. They combine things like people and training and policies and procedures and design features as well as technologies. In Berlin, they worked with the staff for 100 hours on the design of the pro program and with parents and teachers and ended up installing $42,000 worth of hardware, which for a large high school is not a whole lot. But what was impressive was the results. There was a 90% drop in parking lot vandalism. There was a 90% reduction in theft on campus. There was a 33% uh, a, a reduction in truancy, which is interesting, 75% fewer fights, 50% less graffiti, and 75% fewer false, alarm, uh, false fire alarm poles. As far as impact, I think you can see that a comprehensive approach to school security has benefited that high school. There are several other high schools that are now engaged in pilot projects. The idea here is to make this technology and these ideas available nationally through a national center. The second amendment that I'm offering has to do with mentoring. There are uh, about a dozen things within the bill that are authorized for federal grant programs, but mentoring for juvenile offenders, both violent and nonviolent, is not one of them, and I believe it should be. Mr. Chairman, as you know, before I was elected to Congress, I was the cabinet secretary for children, youth, and families in the state of New Mexico, which operated the juvenile <coughs> correction system for the state of New Mexico. And we took a, a long, hard look at juvenile justice reform in New Mexico and the expansion of our juvenile correction system by looking at the kids that were there and what their characteristics were. The fact is that what is missing most in the lives of juvenile offenders is that one caring adult and a positive role model. Half of the kids who are in the custody of the state of New Mexico, which I represent, did not become adult criminals, but you can never tell which half. Of the kids that made it, they generally had something to do. They got their GED, and they had one caring adult. If we can provide mentorships by linking up with communities of faith and establish mentoring programs and businesses and and uh, uh, community groups outside of the institutions when a young person is paroled, um, they have a much better chance of making it into a life uh, that, that is crime-free. 
The final amendment that I'm offering and ask for your consideration of is a parallel of an amendment offered in the Senate to expand uh, and allow the further development of character counts, which is a program that is in several states, but it stresses common values and teaching kids common values in partnership with schools. Those values being caring, citizenship, fairness, respect, responsibility, and trustworthiness. I believe that those that, that the teaching of values and the giving of kids of something positive to believe in is one of the ways that ultimately we will uh, stop crime before it happens. And I ask your favorable consideration of these amendments. Thank you very much. Uh, you've obviously put a lot of uh, time and thought into this. I understand that we've had testimony uh, earlier from uh, Mr. Fletcher and there are other uh, members who are uh, pursuing uh, amendments that are similar to your uh, character counts uh, amendment. Before it happens, and I ask your favorable consideration of these amendments. Thank you very much. Uh, you've obviously put a lot of uh, time and thought into this. I understand that we've had testimony uh, earlier from uh, Mr. Fletcher, and there are other uh, members who are uh, pursuing uh, amendments that are similar to your uh, character counts uh, amendment, and um, I, I hope that you'll have a chance to work with them. I, I, uh, I don't. I assume you've you've met and talked with them about. In fact, I've talked to to uh, Congressman Fletcher, and our amendments are uh, very similar. We just took exactly the Senate language, but they are very similar. And I have told him that uh, if his is made in order and or and and mine is not, that I will be down there four square to help him get his pass. Good. Well, obviously, uh, I don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but clearly. Uh, Whichever one is made in order, you will have uh, played an important role in this, and we appreciate that. Mrs. Myrick. No, I just want to say that I have had personal experience with the program, and I know it works. It's a good program. Thank you. Mr. Frost. Ms. Wilson, um, you want to establish a school security technology center at Sandia National Lab. Uh, who runs Sandia National Lab? Sandia National Lab is operated uh, by Lockheed Martin Corporation. It's not one of the energy department labs out yeah, there. It is the Department sense. of Energy Laboratory. The, manage, the, the contractor is uh, Lockheed Martin Corporation. Well, Lockheed Martin is a fine company. I'm not sure if, that I have a lot of confidence in the energy department being in the security business right now. That's my own concern based upon what we've uh, heard in the recent months. Well, on the contrary, uh, they are one of the preeminent laboratories in the, United, in the United States and indeed the world on security technologies. Um, Sandia National Laboratory is an engineering laboratory. It's responsible for the safety and security of the entire U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile, and uh, they do a very good job. We haven't had any of the problems with the with the Chinese uh, at Sandia, have we? Has that been at Los Alamos? I expect that Sandia National Lab, like our other national labs, are the target of espionage without any without any do any doubt. And whatever counterintelligence efforts we, we undertake at other laboratories are also and should also be applicable to Sandia. What we're talking about here is the protection um, of uh, of a is is both physical and intellectual kinds of protection. And uh, and I think Sandia has shown itself to be a world leader in that. But I understand what you're trying to achieve. I just was asking whether the, we've had any of the problem any of the problems that the Energy Department has had with the security have shown up at Sandia? Um, obviously, it hasn't been, uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, most of the focus has been on Los Alamos and Livermore. Right. Um, but I would, I would not doubt at all that they are also the targets of espionage. I think we have to expect that. Um, they have uh, not, you know, shown uh, some of the, the high-profile cases have not been at Sandia. But I, I think it's quite a separate issue from the one that I'm asking the committee to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. We appreciate your being here. And uh, now, finally, I want to express my appreciation to all the members. Uh, we're, I guess, uh, charging into hour nine of uh, this uh, hearing, along with the other hearing that we had. We started at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So we're happy to uh, represent a panel uh, being led by uh, a gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pascrell, and Mr. Weiner, and uh, Mr. Delahunt, and Ms. Maloney. So please. Come to the table and uh, provide a summary of your remarks. Thank and you, uh, any prepared statement that you have will appear 
mention we have, Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your patience all day. I've been watching and listening. Good well, luck to you. I volunteered for this job. <laughs> Or as I say, I was in line for this job, is basically. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the, uh, this distinguished committee on both sides of the aisle, both Mr. Delahunt and Mr. Weiner, obviously with the Judiciary Committee, Ms. Maloney is also joining us. I'd like to speak on behalf of an, amend an amendment which I'd like to present tonight, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's no legislation that will guarantee the end of gun-related tragedies. I don't think anybody, anyone, thinks that. We should also agree that there are common sense, moderate, responsible steps we can take, and we should take those steps. My amendment, the Child Proof Handgun Act, will do just that. It is the House's first comprehensive personalized handgun legislation. It requires that in five years, all handguns manufactured have to have incorporated into them technology, allowing only an authorized user to fire the weapon. Dozens of patents have already been issued to manufacturers with the technology ranging from radio frequency to finger, fingerprint recognition and many others. We want to accelerate that technology by providing some dollars in this legislation uh, administered by the National Institute of Justice. Opponents will say that we cannot require technology that has not been perfected. The bill addresses this legitimate concern. It requires that the National Institute of Justice, uh, part of the Justice Department, which has already been doing extensive research for several years, to report to the Congress two full years before the requirement kicks in on the status of the technology. This is a very critical part of this bill, Mr. Chairman. If that report concludes that the technology has not been perfected, therefore it does not exist, or will not exist within five years, the requirement does not go into effect. It is responsible. It is practical. No one who is serious about limiting access to firearms by children should oppose it. What we are saying is, let's move this concept forward with a study and a requirement only if that requirement is justified by experts. It is instructive to note that the bill is modeled after a measure in New Jersey written by, by a Democrat and a Republican. This is not a partisan idea. The Democratic Party, the Republican Party is not gonna save us and we need to join together. And that's the spirit with which I offer this amendment to you, Mr. Chairman. The bill meets everyone's goal in this debate. It will drastically reduce the access to firearms by children and does so from the very beginning. I think the time is right for this kind of an initiative. It shows us moving ahead and moving forward with the technology and the state of the art. I, a, I urge the committee to heed uh, the advice uh, written very recently in an editorial in the New York Times. Congress needs to mandate a move to smart gun technology, computer chips and other features that make guns inoperable by anyone other than the weapons owner. Our government requires trial-proof caps on aspirin bottles. And, it's, and it sets standards for child-proof cigarette lighters. Yet handguns have been off limits when it comes to safety improvements. That changes with this legislation, and it must change this week. I ask of you, I beg of you, because I believe this will keep weapons out of the hands of kids who either are going to use it on themselves or other people, intentionally or unintentionally. I thank the committee for your time, Mr. Chairman, and your consideration. And now, I'd like to speak last because I have an, an additional amendment. Mr. Delahunt. Delahunt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I too have another amendment, but I'll wait. Uh, after Ms. Maloney addresses. No, I, 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 I won't, but I, I'm waiting here with, with uh, Ms. Well, if you prefer that, Mr. Chairman, I, I know you would. Uh, I, I just let me just make three very simple points. This is not in any way 
about restricting access to handguns or access to a firearm. I think that's very important to, to know because much has been said about the Second Amendment. We all have a, an oath to the Constitution. We respect the Second Amendment. This has nothing whatsoever to do with the Second Amendment. Truly, this is about saving lives. I think it was 1998, and these are very telling statistics. Put aside the fact that there were some 2,800 children that were victims of homicide, there were approximately 1,800 children who either committed suicide or were the victims of an accidental shooting. I dare say we can look down the road with the availability of the technology that we know, we know is a, will be available and we can save 1,800 lives on an annual basis. 1,800 lives of children, not just adults, but children. If we had lost 1,800 lives in the Balkans during the course of the past 11 weeks, there would be an outrage in this country, appropriately so. We ought to be outraged that there are 1,800 children that are the victims of self-inflicted uh, gunshot wounds or of accidental deaths. This solves that problem. In addition, Mr. Chairman, you know that I was the, the elected district attorney in the greater Boston area for more than 20 years. And I will be speaking to the Boston Gun Project when Mr. Uh, Tom Udall, a former Attorney General from Arizona, comes to speak on his amendment. That particular effort has resulted in the diminution in the course of some 20 years of homicides in, that were committed in the city of Boston from 140 to hopefully this year 20. 20. And what that project discovered, the guns were being not stolen, but the responsibility of the, the problem was focused on the area of gun trafficking. That's how these guns came into the possession of young people who committed, who committed homicides. This particular bill eliminates the problem of traffic because it doesn't make any difference if somebody should steal the bill or sell it or the gun the firearm rather or sell it to somebody else this particular bill with hope with the hopeful results and the very real realistic uh, goals that it, it, it would achieve would eliminate the prof the, the problem of traffic I just think it makes common sense and we should make this kind of investment. And I support the amendment of Mr. Pres Pascrell and Ms. Maloney and Mr. Dean. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I just here in support of my colleague, Mr. Pascrell, and I would encourage the committee to give it favorable consideration. Thank you very much. And I likewise am here in, in support of uh, my colleague's work, particularly Bill. So it is uh, a, a tremendous, uh, it, it's common sense, it, it's workable, there are 30 patents out there already, and it does not take away the ownership of guns, it just merely makes guns inoperable to children, people who may steal them, or anyone who should not have their hand on the gun. The technology would respond only to the owner's imprint or owner's uh, contact with the gun and it would save lives, and it's uh, well thought out, and I compliment uh, my colleagues, especially you. And we hope you'll put it in order. Yes, I have another amendment. Before you all leave, I don't know if Mr. Rice has any questions. No, I have statements that I would like to say to you. Well, I'm going to the record from Jim Maloney, and I'll start with Dr. Rice, who came out after this. 
objection, both of those statements will appear in the record. So, Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Myrick. Thank you very much. Thanks to the panel, and we will thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Appreciate your time. I will wait until uh, the UDAL bill uh, is called. Oh, Mr. Yes. Mr. Tommy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know it's been a long day, and you've uh, been uh, very considerate and, and thoughtful to listen to all of our amendments. But this is an incredibly important issue. I, I, I would like to speak in support of um, amendments concerning gun safety devices. Many amendments have been filed from members on both sides of the aisle, and I am supportive of any amendment uh, that improves gun safety, particularly those offered by uh, my colleague on the other side of the aisle, Sue Kelly, uh, Rosa DeLauro, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, Juanita McDonald. And I am a, a supportive of the original McCollum Hyde provision as passed by the Senate without provision C. Uh, the amendment, uh, some of the amendments before you today replace the, the House language with the Senate language, and I wholeheartedly support the Senate language with one additional provision added to cover a new type of gun safety device. While my amendment would have struck provision C in the McCollum Hyde measure, given that the underlying bill has changed, I would like to offer an amendment that would consist of the Senate passed gun safety language, but would also include the provision a removable hammer or striker contained in both uh, Carolyn McCarthy's bill, Senator Kennedy's bill, and in part of the McCullum Hyde measure. In addition, I support the amendment offered by Representative Sue Kelly, which also addresses the removable hammer language, but is crafted differently. Representative Kelly's amendment adds, and I quote, an easily removable device that if removed is designed to prevent the discharge of the firearm by any person who does not have access to the device. The McCullum Hyde language included any device, which I, I quote, if removed, will prevent discharge of the firearm, end quote. While well intended, the definition is too broad. I think that Representative Kelly's language is clear and closes the, the loopholes that would be created by the McCullum Hyde provision. Given that we're now working with a different underlying bill, it seems that the specific language of all of the amendments will need to be revised. So it's important that you understand my intent my amendment uh, 118 strike section C, removing uh, the broad def definition in McCullum Hyde. This definition could apply to standard firearm parts, even bullets. Someone uh, could take the gun apart and satisfy the requirements of this definition. My amendment preserves pr provision D, uh, which includes the removable hammer or striker, which is intended to cover a new device called a safety hammer. While the Senate passed language appears to cover this promising new device, we want to make sure that it's covered in our bill. I, I, I believe that uh, Representative McCullen intended uh, to include this device when he drafted the language contained in C and D, but, I, but I, I hope that he would agree that the language contained in C is too broad. Uh, we have uh, one simple intent, and that is to save lives by making guns safer. Therefore, I hope that you will uh, give me or someone the opportunity to offer a common sense uh, gun safety amendment that will include the Senate passed language and add to the definition a removal hammer or striker. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm here to request that three amendments be made to H.R. 1501 in order, uh, may be made in order under the rule. The first amendment is an amendment that seeks to increase the mandatory minimum penalties for individuals who possess, brandish, or discharge a firearm during the commission of a federal crime which is violent or involves drug trafficking. 
it would move the possession from it would increase possession from 15 five years excuse me to 10 for brandishing seven years to 15 if the firearm is discharged during the crime the minimum mandatory sentence is increased from 10 years to 20. the legislation is reflective of my feeling that tough sentences do work and i hope that it will be considered to be a part of the floor this proceeding this week my second amendment and I'm going to try to move through these fairly quickly because I know that you all have been here a long time. Uh, but my second amendment um, is H.R. 51, and that looks to toughen the penalties against any person who takes a child hostage in order to resist an, any officer or court in the United States or to compel the federal government to do or abstain from any act. Such a person would serve a minimum sentence of 10 years. If injury results to the child, a minimum mandatory sentence of 20 years. If death results to the child, the perpetrator would be subject to the death penalty or life imprisonment. This legislation has been endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police. In the House, the bill currently has, the, has support from both Republicans and Democrats. It was passed in the last Congress as an amendment to H.R. 3494, the Child Protection Bill, but unfortunately, this provision was dropped in that conference. I believe in all probability it was with the idea that this was a more appropriate bill where that amendment should appear. Um, my third amendment is the Stalking Prevention and Victim Protection Act. That's H.R. 1869. Uh, this is an amendment that alters current anti-stalking law by expanding the federal prohibition on stalking. It broadens the federal definition of stalking, which ca can include email, telephone, and other forms of interstate communication as a means of stalking. It broadens the intent to harm element of the current federal stalking law to include threatening behavior rather than the demonstration of specific threats which closes a very commonly used loophole by stalkers. Very often what happens is that loophole is, is used by stalkers and often there are the um, people who are in charge of, of um, trying, to, uh, trying to make a, a penalty attach are left with a domestic violence crime law rather than something that is really specifically crafted for stalking. Um, it expands the definition of immediate family of the victim to include persons who regularly reside with the victim and that I think is a necessary portion of this bill too. It also adds new provisions including bail restrictions when the person who is accused has a prior conviction of a crime of violence. It has immediate protection orders at the time of sentencing. It can only be removed by the victim. It increases sentencing guidelines for a defendant with a prior conviction of a crime of violence against the same victim or a member of that victim's family. And these provisions were based on recommendations by a 1993 Justice Department report. The report developed a model anti-stalking code and it builds on legislation that it was enacted in the, ninth, in the 104th Congress, which instituted for the first time federal penalties on interstate talk, stalking. One of the reasons I believe this bill is germane to the juvenile justice bill is that children are also are stalked. They are stalked by, they are stalked by family members. They are stalked simply by people who happen to see them on the streets. There are, there are families who are stalked. And by that I mean very often in a domestic violence problem, when a woman tries to leave or a man tries to leave a domestic violence problem and they take the children with them, it is the entire family who then can, will be stalked. And that's why I believe this bill can be a part of, ought to be a part of this, because it's not just an individual who becomes stalked. It becomes a family. I've learned this from work with the uh, 
women, the, with the women's shelters, domestic violence shelters in my region. I think the, uh, it's important also for me to say that this is a slightly modified version of a bill that I'd introduced, H.R. 1869, it, the Stalking Prevention and Victim Protection Act. It, it has the support of over 20 members of Congress from both sides of the aisle, and this bill has been endorsed by the victim, uh, by the National Victim uh, Center uh, as well. Also, I speak not only for myself, but for Representative Kuykendall, who joins me in requesting that this Third Amendment be made in order under this rule. And I'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Kelly. We appreciate you being here. Mr. Chair, I ask the unanimous consent that Representative Kuykendall will be asserting the record. Without objection, it will be included uh, in the record at this point. Mrs. Meyer. Yeah, Sue, I appreciate all your hard work on these, and especially the stalking and those things you've been working on a long time. Um, I did want to bring to your attention, though, H.R. 424, which was my bill in the House. Um, we passed the, the companion bill was um, S-43 in the Senate, and it did come back and was um, passed um, through the House, and it also um, was signed into law by the President. It's exactly the same as your Amendment 56, so it is already law. My amendment number 56, the one with man, in min, in increasing the 51? minimum. I'm sorry. Well, on here it says 56, increase the mandatory minimum penalties for individuals who possess brandish or discharge a firearm. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. on our list. Okay. Yes. So that it's one, it's already law. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we. we all right. That was it. Came okay. back to the house. The there was, was a, not, our bill was four four twenty four. The Senate had um, S forty three. Came back as a Senate version, which was the same, and the president signed it into law last year. Um, but that was not a part of my stalking bill. No, no, no. That was uh, no, no. I know. Part. That's why I'm saying yeah. number fifty six. Oh, no, the stalking bill is totally separate. Yeah, then that's one fight we don't have to fight. Yeah. Isn't it? Well, thank you very much, thank Sue. You. We appreciate all your uh, time and effort. It's very, very important and worthwhile thank you. Uh, endeavor of yours. Our next witness is the uh, gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Good. We're thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy to have you. And uh, again, uh, if you have uh, prepared remarks, they'll appear in the record, and we would welcome a summarization of this. First, I want to say thank you for being here. I know the hour is very late. I have two amendments to offer to the Juvenile Justice Bill. The first would require a two-thirds vote before a system of registration of firearms or firearm owners could be adopted, and that two-thirds vote would be, uh, uh, could only be waived by an affirmative vote of two-thirds in the House. Uh, the second amendment would, uh, that I propose would repeal the existing prohibition in the District of Columbia from, uh, on a private individual from having a firearm for self-protection. As you know, there are only a, a few very limited instances where a person can have a uh, firearm in the district, and I think most criminals know that, and it would go a long way to reduce crime if they didn't know whether you had a, a firearm in your home or apartment. Great, thank you very much. Those are uh, interesting approaches uh, to this uh, issue. Mr. Hastings? Thank you. Mrs. Myrick? Thank, thank you very you. much, and thanks for being here, and thanks for being so brief. Uh, next, uh, we are scheduled to hear from a panel consistent of uh, Ms. McCarthy and Ms. Rakama and Mr. Bogoyevich. And, uh, I'm holding the fort for all of them, Mr. Chairman. So Thank you're uh, representing this entire panel. Well, I'm convinced that you're up to it, and we. Uh... Well, number one, I know my uh, number one. Thank you for allowing us to uh, be here. Uh, my colleague um, Marge Rokema from New Jersey was here earlier and discussed our uh, amendment a little bit earlier. Unfortunately, my colleague from Chicago, uh, Rod Bakoyevich, is stuck in the fog, <laughs> so he did not get here. So I will be representing all of us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are here to offer a modest bipartisan amendment to truly close the gun show loophole. I believe it's important that we have the opportunity to debate our amendment on the House floor for three basic reasons. First, the gun show issue has already been hotly debated in the U.S. Senate and at kitchen tables across America. But we have not had an adequate opportunity to debate gun shows in the House because of a decision to skip full committee consideration. 
Unfortunately, that has made all of your jobs a little bit harder today, I think. Floor debate and a vote on our amendment will allow members of the House of Representatives to demonstrate how they view the gun show issue. Last week, the Speaker of the House stated that he would like to ensure that members of the House have the opportunity to fully express their positions on critical issues on the House floor, and our amendment will allow members to do so on very important issues involving children's access to guns. Number two. Secondly, Mr. Uh, Chairman, our amendment offers a clear contrast to the amendment offered by the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee on gun shows. For example, we define what gun shows uh, that are a little bit different than the Chairman's amendment. We believe our definition will ensure that criminals will not be able to skip the background check process, and we are concerned that the Chairman's definition will allow the loophole to remain open. It is critical that the House of Representatives debate and vote on the two fundamentally different de definitions of what a gun show really is. The third reason, Mr. Chairman, our amendment is based on the Senate passed amendment. Since the Senate adopted the approach advanced in our amendment, there has been a massive misinformation campaign designed to discredit closing the gun show loophole by utilizing the worst kind of scare tactic tactics, I'm afraid. The National Rifle Association has compared closing the gun show loophole with Nazi policies. They've also threatened that we are trying to close all gun shows, which is not true at all. If the Rules Committee does not allow us to have a rational debate on the House floor, you'll be sending a message that irresponsible scare techniques uh, work and uh, prevent us from doing the job we're supposed to do. You would be saying that the House of Representatives can be scared into denying a full and fair debate because we are afraid of the irresponsible special interest scare tactics. If I could, for just one side note, Mr. Chairman, while preparing for the Rules Committee, I was rereading the Department of Treasury and Department of Justice January 1990 report on gun shows. In the report, the NR NRA argues that because only 2% of the firearms purchased at gun shows are purchased by criminals, we do not need to regulate gun shows in the way we regulate gun shops. I look at the same statistics and I say it is a reason for us to act, not a reason to dismiss. I believe most of my colleagues in Congress and many of the American people would agree that we should treat gun shows and gun shops equally. When even according to the NRA, 2% of the guns sold at these gun shows are going to criminals. Please keep in mind that 2% are the guns that are used against our police officers, our citizens, sold to gangs, and those criminals are using those guns to make most of our lives pretty miserable. I also want you to know that the National Alliance of Stocking Gun Dealers, they're the ones that are actually at the gun shows selling the guns. They believe everyone at a gun show should be licensed and should be also uh, go to the uh, NIC's accreditation. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I urge you to f allow for a full and fair debate on our amendment to close the gun show loophole. This is a critical opportunity issue that deserves the attention of the full House of Representatives. Our amendment offers a clear alternate to other gun show amendments before the committee. And finally, allow allowing our amendment on the floor will show the American people that the House of Representatives is committed to debating important issues in a rational and deliberative manner. We should not be scared off by the worst and most irresponsible kind of scare techniques. Mr. Chairman, on a final note, um, when I came to Congress, I certainly came to try and reduce gun violence in any way I could. And I have done my best and will continue to do my best to work with members on both sides of the House. To me, this is not a political issue. To me, this is something that's very personal. This is something that I care about because with the shootings in the schools across this country, but also losing 13 children a day, my vow was to try and reduce violence in this country. And I will continue to do that. And I hope that you will allow our bipartisan um, committee to really go forward with this amendment. And well, I thank, thank you. you very much, Ms. McCarthy. We appreciate your uh, dedication to the cause of ensuring we see an end to this kind of uh, horrible violence. And appreciate you. your thoughtful testimony, Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Myrick. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, our next uh, witness is a uh, gentlewoman from Nevada, Ms. Berkeley, joined by a gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Udall. Uh, welcome to the uh, 
Rules Committee, and uh, thank you for your patience. We will, uh, I suspect this may be the first appearance uh, for you before the Rules Committee, for both of you, but uh, we hope that it'll be the first of many, not necessarily at this hour on every occasion, <laughs> but we're happy to have you, and you're welcome to proceed and summarize any prepared statement that you have will appear in the record. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to be here, and indeed, the first time that um, I've uh, appeared before the Rules Committee. Um, having sat here since around 8 o'clock this evening, this is bringing new meaning to me about, you know, that old adage, everything has been said, but not everybody has yet said it. Um, I'd like to... started with us at 2 o'clock this afternoon. And, uh, <laughs> that could have been said uh, by about 4 o'clock this afternoon. I'll be we've blessed had, We've actually had some very interesting testimony. I've enjoyed sitting here. As a matter of fact, I thought about, mm -hmm. you know, doing something else this evening and waiting my turn because I knew uh, with my level of seniority I'd be sitting here a long time. But I think this is an important mm -hmm. issue, and I've enjoyed listening to everybody. Um, uh, it's been very thought-provoking and very important uh, testimony. Um, I want to thank you for giving comments. Congressman Mark Udall and I the opportunity to present to you our proposed amendment to H.R. 1501, the Child Safety and Protection Act, our amendment entitled the After School Education and Anti-Crime Act would expand after school programs by building on the 21st Century Community Learning Centers Act to give local schools and communities even more options for improving student performance and reducing juvenile crime. The amendment would provide $600 million in federal funding to help 1 million children around the country who are waiting for after-school programs. And let me tell you a little bit about my district and the need uh, that we have for such programs. I have the fastest growing community in the United States. I have a district with the fastest growing school age population in the United States. I have 5,000 new residents every month coming to Las Vegas, Nevada, and they bring their children with them. We have 210,000 students in our Clark County School District. We have doubled our size in 10 years, and we will double again in the very near future. I represent a 24-hour town. We've got three shifts. We have people working around the clock. We've got the problem that that creates dictates that I sit before you today and ask for additional after-school programming and the funding that we need. Uh, for all the wonderful things I can say about my district, and I can, I often think I'm a one-woman chamber of commerce for the Las Vegas Valley, but we do have the highest dropout rate in the United States, and we also have the highest teen pregnancy rate in the United States. These are problems that we believe we can solve by good after-school programs. The demand for after-school programs in Southern Nevada is very high. Last year, our school district could only serve 3,000 students with after-school programs out of the 30,000 that have been identified identified as children in need of these programs. An elementary school teacher, Tracy Cook, said it best. She said at a video conference that I conducted in my, in my district that a lot of my students are wearing their keys around their necks. They are letting themselves into their homes because no one is home when they get there. Children are at risk during the critical after-school hours. According to the FBI, juvenile crime peaks between 3 and 6 p.m. when school is out and most people are at work. And in my district, I have a preponderance of single women who are uh, single single working women who are raising their children by themselves. They have no other alternative but to be working, and I believe that I've got the highest percentage of that type of uh, family in the United States. After school programs give our children safe, productive places to go after the school bell rings and productive activities such as mentoring programs that have been discussed tonight, academic assistance has been discussed, recreational activities that have been discussed, technology and job training skills and drug, alcohol and gang prevention programs. I've held town hall meetings and video conferences throughout my district on safe schools and crime prevention. The number one thing that comes up when I open up the discussion and I ask the audience, what do you want? What can we do to prevent crime? What can we do to prevent school violence? What can we do to make these schools safer for your kids in a better, more wholesome environment? Each and every time, the first thing that comes out is give us good after-school programs. Give our kids a place to go. Give them a healthy and wholesome environment where they can stay when, they're, when school is over so that they can have help with their homework, have mentors that are so important, even have 
recreational activities to keep them off the streets. And that's why more than 450 police chiefs, sheriffs, and prosecutors, along with the presidents of the Fraternal Order of Police and the International Union of Police Associations, have urged expansion of after-school programs. You ho uh, we hope Mark and I hope that you will agree with more than 90% of the voters who favor providing more after-school programs and allow us, allow us to offer this amendment on the floor. And if I may just make one other, um, uh, one other comment before I turn it over to my uh, learned and knowledgeable colleague, I want to express my strong support for Bill Cullum's amendment that would allow additional district judges for the states of Arizona, Florida, and Nevada. The McCullum Amendment would give relief to our overwork system by providing the first ad additions to our judicial circuit since 1984. That's 15 years ago, and since then, my population in southern Nevada has more than doubled. When you consider exponential population growth in Nevada, you would surely see the desperate need that we have for additional federal judgeships. In 1998 alone, our district judges filed a total number of 800 163 cases, almost double the national average of 497 cases, and yet we have no relief. We need to give our judges additional help by creating more judgeships in these three states. Even more startling is the fact that Nevada is ranked third in the country for the growth of civil cases and eighth in the growth of felony cases. As an attorney and as a representative for the, for the first district in Nevada, I urge you to allow this amendment as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I will be brief. Uh, I think uh, my colleague has done a fine job of summarizing the legislation. I do have a prepared statement I would like to include in the record. No, what I thought I would do is just take a minute and talk from my past professional life. And I worked for many years for the Outward Bound uh, program in Colorado. There are many of them around the country. And what we found there is that if you can expose a young people to positive role models, then they're going to be interested in productive adventure. I think young people want adventure, but adventure can come in a form where you steal a car or you get a hold of an illegal weapon and experiment with it, or it can come in the form of embracing athletics and fine academic performance. And I found that in working those programs, you're out in the, the woods, you're running rivers, you're climbing mountains, navigating deserts, spending time with young people. You were sweating, you were crying, you were working hard, but you still didn't know everything that was going on in that peer group. But if you made yourself available and you asked questions and you listened, you often would find out what was going on in those peer groups that might cause trouble in the long run. I've been going around and visiting with, with uh, high school students all over my district. That's a pledge that I made. And I would add that a part of my district includes the Jefferson County School District, which is where the Littleton tragedy occurred. And those young people, are they're keen to be involved. They're keen to help us help them identify young people who are in trouble. But they need a place where it's not just their parents, but their adults that they trust that they can reach. And this bill would really help do that, to expand a program for which there's a great demand. Last year you heard there were over 2,000 applications, but we could only grant 200 of those. So I asked the committee to make this amendment in order, and I appreciate your time. I was here at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Your endurance is awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate your both being here. Mr. Hastings? Mr. Frost? No questions. This is my Thank, Thank you, you Thank both you very, very much. much for being here, and thanks for sticking out. And our final witness is uh, another Udall, a gentleman from New Mexico. Tom, we're happy to have you, and I assume that this, too, is your first appearance before the committee. And, and you are uh, closing out the uh, hearing on uh, these very two important bills that we look forward to considering on the House floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you today, uh, members of the committee. And, in uh, viewing what you've done today, I, I, uh, I also think it's an awesome task, the Rules Committee, that you have to tackle all of these amendments, and it's probably uh, one of the most unappreciated jobs and uh, one of the toughest, I think. So I applaud you on your effort uh, here plowing through all of these. Um, in my life before the, the Congress, I was a federal prosecutor and I was also a state attorney general uh, for eight years. And in that experience, one of the things that I learned was that gun crimes uh, were not given a priority. And the reason uh, that is, there are various reasons, but uh, I think it's fair to say in looking at prosecutions that 
that we have many gun crimes that have not been prosecuted. And I, I have a very simple amendment. It's, it is taking uh, the 93 United States Attorney's offices in the country and putting an extra prosecutor in each of those offices and dedicating that prosecutor solely to the prosecution of the gun crimes that are on the books right now. And the priority would be given to crimes of violence and repeat offenders. Very simple idea. I believe, I truly believe that in listening to all of this debate before your committee, on the House floor, and all of the discussions I hear, that the common ground between Democrats and Republicans on this issue is the enforcement issue. And I believe the way you tackle that issue is put the resources there so that you can send a very, very tough message that if you commit a crime of violence with a gun, that the book is going to be thrown at you. And that's the idea. It's a simple one. It's not a very costly one. And it's one that I think would bring all of us together. And I would hope that the committee uh, would make this amendment in order. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings. One real brief question. Um, I'm not familiar with the makeup of the judicial districts, but uh, the way you're, the way at least you described it, the assumption I get is that there is an equal amount of potential uh, uh, gun law, you know, people breaking gun laws in each of those judicial districts, because you're just adding, uh, you're just adding one person to each of them. Uh, is, is that right? I mean, is there, is there, is it spread that equally across the, the country, or is there some areas that have a whole lot more? The, you're talking about the cases that aren't, right. mis, uh, Mr. Hastings, that aren't prosecuted? That's correct. I, you know, I don't know how evenly they're spread. Uh, my idea in tackling this, I believe that the judicial districts, which the United States attorneys serve in, and there are 93 of them, the larger states, many of the larger states have three or four districts. A state like New Mexico has one district. Um, it's probably fairly uniform, I would say, but I think the way to approach prosecution is to say, let's put one in every office, let's see what the result is. Uh, at that point, we can ask the, the United States attorneys that are on the job to come back to us and tell us you know, what results they've had, what, what their, how far they've moved forward. And, and you may well see that, that you need additional resources in other areas. Okay, well, yeah, I, just, I just bring it up, maybe you answered my question with your last, uh, your last comment, because it's, I, would, I would just guess, and I don't know this for a fact, but I, guess there are prob I would guess there are probably less violations in some parts of the country, and there's more violations in other parts of the country, so. Well, I, but I think the figures that I've seen uh, show that there are huge, huge numbers of gun cases that are not being prosecuted. I mean, we have 20,000 regulations and statutes that are able to be prosecuted. And believe me, if you serve in a United States Attorney's Office or a State Attorney General's Office, with the large numbers of cases that are coming in, whether they're murders or rapes or bank robberies or, or whatever the violations, the, the frequently the gun cases uh, don't receive the priority they should receive. And so my, my argument is to say, Congress, send a message to the violators that you're going to make this a priority and you're going to treat guns differently. Well, I, I, would, I would agree with you that, uh, that these uh, violations have not been prosecuted. In fact, in the last six years or something like that, they've decreased by close to 50 percent across the country. And, that's, and, and while your approach, I think, is, is one that, uh, that may resolve that problem, I just wanted to make the point and ask you uh, if these are if they're evenly uh, divided, and so. But I uh, clearly we have to prosecute those that break gun laws. I don't think anybody argues with that at all. They need to be prosecuted. So. And Mr. Hastings, I, this isn't an accusation at anybody in terms of prosecution. From my perspective, I believe that we've seen a, a pretty dramatic increase in prosecutions, but we we have the ability to do it much better. We have the ability to do it more thoroughly, and I think the way you do that is put the resources in the United States Attorney's Office to do that job. Okay. Good. Thank you, Mr. Thank you.
Mr. Frost? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Uh, just a similar, uh, following up on Doc, I come from an area that has a very heavy caseload and um, uh, we certainly could use an extra prosecutor. There's no question about that. I have the same concern, of course, is where the money's going to come from to pay for it, like everything we do here, you know, something has to give to do that. So um, I wonder also whether there might be an opportunity to look at areas of the country that, um, as um, Mrs. Berkeley said, Las Vegas has a severe problem. We have a severe problem. Other places do that maybe we could do something and start there to prove and then without putting one everywhere in case they really don't need it. Again, just because dollars are short, but I certainly support the need. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Udall. We appreciate you. your being here. And uh, <clears throat> it appears that we have uh, completed <laughs> our uh, witness list of the 175 amendments that were filed. And uh, I would like to uh, first express my appreciation to all the members of the Rules Committee. I know that everyone isn't still standing at this point or sitting here, but uh, we've had virtually every member of the committee here uh, over the last uh, nine hours. And uh, I do appreciate that. And I will say that it's uh, our intention to uh, uh, early tomorrow evening proceed with uh, marking up this rule. We're going to obviously be having some discussions tomorrow, and we have a scheduled meeting time of 7 o'clock uh, tomorrow evening, um, during which we will uh, mark this up as well as the other um, piece of legislation that we uh, are considering, Mr. Weldon's bill. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, is there any reason why we are delaying the meeting until 7 p.m. tomorrow? Uh, well, yes. Uh, there are a number of other meetings that are going to be taking place uh, throughout the day, and I think that it's going to, uh, obviously, with 175 amendments, we've got a number of discussions that will be taking place between now and late tomorrow, and we had scheduled that time uh, for 7. And it's my hope that we will not have to... Um, uh, take a long period of time once we have worked this out, and I hope we'll have bipartisan support for uh, what it is that we're going to try to do. It, because again, it's our intent to address uh, all of the concerns that have been raised, or as many as possible the concerns that have been raised today. Does the chair still contemplate uh, this committee making in order two separate pieces of legislation, one on juvenile justice and the other on uh, guns? That is the intention now that we've, everyone has gotten copies of the, uh, of the measures. We have uh, both of them um, before us, and uh, it's our hope that we work that out. But again, we'll be working uh, tonight and tomorrow on that before. Is finalized. it contemplated that both of these pieces of legislation would be on the floor on Wednesday? That is the plan. The plan is to uh, begin Wednesday morning uh, with uh, both of these measures. Uh, when will the House vote on the uh, uh, the other, the aviation legislation. That, that is scheduled to be up first thing tomorrow morning on the House floor. We filed the uh, rule on the floor a couple of hours ago, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll look forward to consideration of that. Mm -hmm. That'll take a uh, look at the uh, bipartisan agreement on that rule. Mm -hmm. We will, I'm sure, be taking the better part of tomorrow on that legislation. Is it uh, contemplated that the uh, the juvenile justice and gun legislation might continue over until Thursday, or would we uh, stay uh, late? Follow uh, the Wednesday? Rules Committee precedent for a meeting, you mean, uh, well mm -hmm. into the night? Mm -hmm. um, at this juncture, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to uh, carry over into Thursday uh, on that. And, and then, as you know, we're looking forward to consideration of the Department of Transportation Appropriation Bill. And, in, in the committee? Well, we'll be probably meeting in the committee on Wednesday on that, I, mm -hmm. I think. And then uh, we're hoping that on, uh, on Thursday or maybe on Friday that we'll be able to move ahead with that. Uh, one final question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is it contemplated that it, should we make in order two separate pieces of legislation, one on juvenile justice and the other on guns, mm -hmm. that we would on the floor consider the juvenile justice legislation first and the gun legislation second, would that be the order? I, I think it's uh, premature to make a determination as to exactly uh, which bill will be considered first, but uh, I think that uh, we can safely conclude that we will be considering both. Mm -hmm. Will they both be covered by a single rule or will they be two separate rules? Uh, I think at this point it's uh, very likely that we'll have a single rule that will cover both of the measures uh, since we've proceeded here over the last nine hours with uh, 
consideration of the two. Is, does the chair have any concern that by combining both bills into one rule that it could be difficult to pass the rule on the floor? Well, we're, again, that's one of the reasons we're going to be meeting late, be meeting late uh, tomorrow afternoon or early evening in hopes that we are able to put together uh, strong support for the rule. Mm -hmm. um, how much notice will the, uh, uh, will the minority have as to uh, what is contemplated to be content to contain be contained in the rule prior to the meeting well as my friend knows we um try our darndest to uh get to the minority uh, whatever information just as early as we possibly can and uh so i uh, can't tell you the exact amount of time but we're planning to meet right now at seven o'clock mm -hmm. tomorrow and as soon as we come to a conclusion on our proposal for the rule we will make sure that uh, my friend has a copy of it um, in the past, uh, I don't know, I don't have to ask staff, but the, has the procedure been at least uh, 30 minutes before the committee meeting? Is what is there a set procedure, set amount of time? Mm -hmm. Is it contemplated by the chair that uh, we would have some sort of at least 30 minutes notice uh, prior to the hearing as to? Uh, what would be uh, made in order, what is contemplated being made in order? We will try our doggone just to make sure that you have it even earlier than that. Mm -hmm. Even earlier than that. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to uh, further consideration of the committee on this uh, complicated matter, uh, which will uh, not be dealt with easily by the full House representative. Well, I thank my uh, friend, and I again uh, appreciate uh, forbearance of uh, the committee members and those who were uh, witnesses today and with that the uh, rules committee stands adjourned crime bill the Rules Committee has been working on will be debated on the House floor this Wednesday. You can see live coverage on our companion network, C-SPAN. Coming up next, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan and the heads of various technology companies on the impact.